Hey everybody, we're gonna get started here in about 11 minutes. Just setting everything up. Invite IRI, <laughs> invite IRI to sign. We'll definitely collaborate with IRI. It's just, unfortunately, I use Restream, and the last time I tried to co collaborate with IRI using Restream, it screwed his stream up, screwed mine up, so we'll definitely make it happen. Yo, what up, Grit? It's the round table to be about. Um, we're going to talk the election. We're going to talk the State of the Union. We're going to talk the Supreme Court. We'll talk about basically whatever the, the other fellas want to talk about, but probably the economy too, since we have a con boy there. Tommy Nicoletti. Yeah, don't apologize. You didn't know. It's okay. I love IRI. IRI is the best. Let's see here. What's that doing? Um... My condolences to you and your family. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm talking about my grandma Mary. She's 87 years old, outspokenly liberal, a voracious reader, highly intelligent, major influence on my life, major influence. She and I were like this. Yeah, she passed away. 87 years old, and she was independent her entire life. So she'd been single for 30 years, divorced, lived by herself, and... Um, Lived on her terms until the day she passed away. All right, I'm going to throw my earbuds in because we got Staxiums here. This guy. No, yeah, I'm Josiah at Pondering Politics, but a convoy will be here in about 10 minutes. What's up, baby? Hey, Stax is restreaming. Excuse me, Econoboy is restreaming with us to those who are seeing uh, us early. What's yeah, up, but he'll buddy? come on soon. How's it going? Tired, man. Yeah, Tired. I feel that. I heard about your grandma. I'm sorry. Appreciate that, buddy. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. At the uh, funeral hard. <laughs> next uh, next Monday, so I'll be out of town on the weekend. Then it's a uh, St. Patrick's Day pub crawl. Yeah. Oh, that sounds fun. It does sound fun. More fun than I've had, Yeah. I've uh I've had that happen so many times that I no longer have any grandparents around. So I definitely know that feeling. Yeah. And what it's like to go through. I appreciate that, buddy. <clears throat> Fine. Um, Who is Staxium? That's me. I am I make videos on TikTok and YouTube occasionally. Very occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally um, stretching it. That implies that you have more. You have a you have a passing acquaintance with YouTube. Yeah, like fair, fair. I just I just uh, I don't know. We'll see. But I make videos on TikTok. Are you using the right mic? Yeah, yeah, I am. Well, now you got me worried. I think your mic looks good. Sounds good. It also looks good. Thank you. It is a uh, robust looking mic, isn't it? It looks very professional. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, what about you? Keep saying Supreme Court, and then I ask you, what about the Supreme Court? And I don't, I don't know where you've asked me about what about the Supreme Court. And to be honest with you, buddy, I love you, but with all the crap I've got going on, you need to limit your, you need to like get all your 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 questions to me in a single text because yeah, it's my fault. Less likely, yeah. My uh, fault. Um, well, I was like, do we want to do, um, the, the nine zero, uh, decision with Colorado? Yeah, that's going to, that's definitely going to come up also the, the pending Trump immunity question. And then I want to get every, as well. I want to get everybody's take on at this point, I think we need to revisit the notion of Supreme court reform and actually Pisco might be, uh, I guess so. to that. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to speak for him. Um, but we'll see. <gasps> Everyone's saying that your mic is off. Your your audio sounds different is what they're saying. My audio sounds different. I mean, it sounds a little echoey. I will be honest. doesn't sound amazing. I but I don't think it's terrible. How does it sound now? 
Oh, uh, quiet, but much better. So turn it up. What about now? That's there you go. Hey, all right, folks, tell me how it sounds now. I think that that's much better, but we'll see what the commenters say. Perfect. Got I only worked as an audio engineer for three years. What do I know? He also <laughs> has a, um, has an album out. That's true. I made music when I was fucking 16 to 18 and then He's 19 years old now. So it's not that, it's not that <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ago. It's pretty recently. Uh, no. Um, yeah, I tried making music forever ago and then that was not the path forward. So then I got into politics. Um, uh, no, it's the folks. It's the same mic. It's literally the same mic, the same system. If anything, I'm now ratcheting up the gain. Oscar, Oscar wouldn't mislead me. Real Bill P says Staxiums. I just subscribe to your YouTube channel. I, I will read it. I will read it. You respond to it. You're right. Okay. Staxiums. I just subscribed to your YouTube channel. This old guy expects great content. Five by five at Pondering Politics. Now, why well, don't you address Bill P? There's already, well, thank you so much. There's already great content on there. It's just, I don't, I, I make TikTok videos pretty regularly. Um, YouTube's just, I don't know why I don't post there, but, um, yeah, I've got a video. That's a really good question. A really good question. You should, you should post to it more. I see, the thing is stacks. I mean, I can't, I see you posting three times a day and I think that's the only way ever, um, that anyone can operate on YouTube. And I go, I don't think I can do that. So then that's I don't. not true. That's not true. Well, I mean, it's. It helps, but it's also done um, terrible things for my physical and mental health. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I Dude. remember. You, I remember you calling me when you were working three jobs because you because right now you're at two jobs, right? You didn't pick up another one like a psycho. I right? so at least for the for the foreseeable future, <clears throat> I've stopped writing for Luke. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Is he looking for someone to? That's a really good with? question that you should be talking about live. That's a really good question. Fair. But, no, I, I have no, I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Work. <laughs> yeah. But right now I'm down to one job, which is YouTube, which is that's nice, beautiful. But, that's yeah. sick. Uh, <laughs> Got to do something when th uh, Twitter is throttled. Yeah. Um, Reuploading TikToks as YouTube shorts is like a cheat code at, you know, cat here it's is smart correct. like it it's well, smart. but you like, don't do just minute you don't do minute videos anymore. yeah i mean well so tiktok pays a lot more if you reach more than a minute so lately i've been trying to hit a lot longer videos um but like i've got videos that hit you know like hundreds of thousands like millions of views and we can i should just like re-upload those to, to youtube that's an obvious thing i should be doing that makes financial sense that that makes sense to everyone who would think that through um, but I just decided not to. So, because I mostly because I dislike Josiah, and Josiah gets really worked up when I don't. So, doesn't take much to get me worked up though in today's political climate. I'm likely to snap at the the drop of a, a true. Bucket. All right, got three minutes. Anyone who tries to see the movie Oppenheimer, Pisco says he'll be right here. Be right Sorry, there. should I? Is it okay that I read comments? I'm just no. You should absolutely practice your reading. Okay. I agree. Getting off topic. Anyone in the chat see the movie Oppenheimer? It's that's one of my favorite movies I've ever seen in my life. I've got I've a letterbox, not seen it, but now I don't want to see it now. If you like it, <laughs> screw you. I've got a letterbox where I keep track of um, my top 100 movies, and I think Oppenheimer made it to number four, if I'm remembering correctly. It's top five for sure. How do you that... feel about the rise of Skywalker? That is, <laughs> you're just triggering me. This is your worst take is that Rise of Skywalker is low key good. And that's it's it's it it's is just good. a little bit. It's it just is. so insane. It's, it's a dumpster fire. Insane. It's a dumpster fire, but it's fun. It's not fun. It honestly gives me an ulcer every time I watch it. I you watch it more consider often. it. I consider it non Star Wars canon. And I think it is the worst. I think it's the only bad Star Wars movie, like the only actual terrible one. Like I consider even Force Awakens fine neutral maybe really yeah cool that's cool that's fine i love that you have you know low-key support for the movie which ruined the franchise and set the sequels up for abject failure that's good 
Yeah. Ryan Johnson was able to make it work. So Ryan Johnson did remarkably well with the shitty hand he was dealt. Imagine if he was coming after a film that actually, actually tried to, to do something sure. good. I agree. <sighs> Let's see. Um, is this for liberal centrists or further left? I, I am offended at the notion of being called a centrist. I reject that categorically. But whether or not you consider me leftist or liberal it depends my my buddies at the vanguard consider me an msnbc liberal even though they're quite fond of me uh others think that i'm basically a stone's throw away from communist uh, uh so i consider myself if i if i'm liberal if i'm liberal i want to be as lefty as a liberal can get Centrist. that makes sense yeah. i think that we're both fair i think everyone who's joining is fair it could is probably center left is probably the best. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't ever I, use the word to... center with you. Listen, if you want to describe yourself that way, that's fine. <laughs> but when I hear center, when I hear center or centrist, right, like just, I start to have so an much. aneurysm. Like I can't, I can't do uh, it. Right. Are you in favor of Stalin, Josiah? I am Stalin until Econoboy and Pisco get here. <laughs> nice. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah. What's up, What's up Pisco? baby? How do I sound? You sound, you sound great. You sound amazing. We'll let we'll let chat be. Uh, the judge of that how are you guys doing um oh i don't really care about how Stax is doing but i'm doing fine Stax, this is the first time i met you, how you yeah doing? how's it going man Good do you know who i am you. do you know who this whole space yeah is you're or? i've i've seen you i i watch destiny very occasionally gotcha, and i've gotcha. seen you on there uh i know you're a lawyer um i am he's that's billing about it right now by the way the clock's all starting yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's about all i know about you so that's awesome. Yeah, I, so, so, do you have any familiarity with Econo Boy, or is this also a first? Yeah, time no, I I know Econo. I follow his content pretty well, and we've had a few conversations. Um, he's kind of smart. He's yeah, up. I like him a lot. He's yeah. not bad. <laughs> Honestly, he's here purely for the sex appeal. Not, By the not way, congratulations, Just that big e. uh, Desire on two hundred thousand subscribers on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, that's awesome. Impressive Crazy. numbers. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, baby. I love it. I love it. I appreciate it. It's uh, it's been super stressful. Um, but we'll see where. Let's see where we can go. How Diving has the transition into... been? It's been so for those who are curious, about like three weeks ago or something like that, I finally, finally quit my day job and uh am doing this full time. You're a content creator. Yeah. And um it's been better. I I it's been better. I, I really don't miss my day job, but it was it was tough because when you're used to a like a particular type of brick and mortar situation, more conventional job. Mm -hmm. You know, what was it is... like when the deep state introduced you to everyone? <laughs> yeah. So honestly, that deep state, like uh, that luncheon that I had after the transition where, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the deep state took me into the dungeon, you know, like beneath the White House, the secret bunker where George Soros and Secretary mm -hmm. Clinton and Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, obviously the real puppet masters behind the Biden regime. Uh, yeah, they, it was a great luncheon. Listen, great I'm luncheon. glad you got your your kudos there because you certainly don't get a lot of uh, credit online standing Joe Biden. Mm hmm. That's true. That's true. We got a Connor boy. What's up, baby? Got a full squad. Hello. We're 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 out here. We as are. the children say. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get started in anything, can you all confirm? Because it looks like shit's working. But can you all confirm on your ends? The shit's working. Well, I, I can working. confirm some shit was working because I looked at my Twitter feed while I was getting my coffee and mm -hmm. I saw that I had tweeted, even though I never tweeted. And so yeah. apparently days ago, I gave you permission to control my social media feeds. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> I can shit confirm that, on that, there. that you are allowed to post on my Twitter. No, so I think <laughs> Stacks, correct me if I'm wrong, but when mm -hmm. I go live, if your shit's paired to me, it yep. automatically sends that announcement that things are going live yeah that's correct perfect it's uh part of the program you're set up with <clears throat> yeah part okay. of the program and part of the the scam to get access to our accounts Rumine. True. I, oh, sorry, dude. Pondering. I dead named you my bad by the way uh pisco and akana boys dms are much spicier than you would think i already had access to stack <laughs> the, what do you mean the, by that the amount of dick pics that I have seen in Econoboy Whoa. and Pisco's DMs. Yeah. I mean, just just sausage for days, man. Oh, you mean Not all my Twitter own. DMs? Yeah. Sort yeah. of like how the Justice Department got Trump's Twitter DMs. I've heard. I've heard. Have you read that? No, I've not. Is that is well, that a thing? I've heard that. Yeah. Oh. It seems like Jack Smith is really doing his job. 
getting after the uh, whatever messages he was sending to random accounts. Man, so here's what I was thinking. So the idea was to go for like 90 minutes. Um, obviously, if people have to dip before or, or, or want to go longer, that's fine. I don't have anything concretely planned for the rest of the night, but like ballpark 90 minutes. Um, and then, of course, in terms of topics, again, obviously flexible, but we had President Biden's State of the Union. We had that landmark Supreme Court decision with respect to the 14th Amendment. Um, uh, we also have <laughs> the uh, upcoming, uh, you know, immunity thing that I want to talk about. And then the economy as well, which I know Econoboy is not very familiar with the economy, but the rest of us can help like pick up the slack. You know, Econoboy, I, uh, I thought you were going to say that inflation was over. It's still at 3%. Didn't you predict it would be normal <laughs> within three months? That's true. I did. Yeah. I did actually make that exact prediction. <laughs> I am a hack. And I'm happy to go whatever direction you want to start with. Uh, what are you most interested in, in the news? So I, th I feel like we've got to hit these as much as possible because um, I, mean, I guess we'll start with the State of the Union because it's most topical, right? And then the other things I feel like um, are not quite as time sensitive, uh, but the, the State of the Union speech will be increasingly less relevant with each passing day. The economy and the Supreme Court being the way they are, are evergreen. Um, let's start with that. So Thursday, President Biden gave the State of the Union. And it, I think 32 million people viewed it, which is like a 20%, 18 to 20% increase from 2023. Wow. So he had a hell of a bully pulpit. Um, and the flash polls during the State of the Union in the aftermath, pretty mm -hmm. favorable. I think it was 64% mm -hmm. uh, favorability for the president. Now, mm -hmm. to clarify, these things very rarely are permanent. Uh, again, they're flash polls for a reason. But again, the immediate response was positive. So yeah. what do you all think of the State of the Union? I assume you were all good little Biden simps and deep state assets. You all watched it, right? <laughs> I watched it. Guy, you, you, you've got to watch Biden on one and a half speed, for sure. I you didn't. can't watch Biden at regular speed. At, at one and a half speed, he is a brilliant orator. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Oh, he, still, he still messed up the only name that he didn't need to get right that entire night. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, I don't care what speed you put on it. He had, he had to get that name right, and he, and he messed it up. Um, yeah. I, my initial reaction to to you, Josiah, is I would be I would put even more hesitancy on your I don't know uh, reaction to the initial public assessment. I do agree that in terms of pundit assessment and in terms of what I thought in terms of how he looked generally, it was good. But I, I think I've seen other flash polls of it being more positive for Biden in the past before. And so, just as a comparative analysis, I, I don't really know that there's we should put that much weight into. One, state, states of the union generally, and two, um, the polling after states of the union, especially since this one looked less than it was before. That said, in terms of the direction of the campaign being more aggressive, and in terms of Biden um, himself as a figure, he looked to be, I think, going in the right direction that I want to see him in. And so that's what gave me more comfort than the uh, yeah. pundit spins in the polls. What about you, the kind of boy? I mean, I think that... I think that one of the reasons why we may have seen increased viewership, one of the reasons why we may have seen um, like a relatively positive response from the State of the Union is because I think that the the narrative about Biden having dementia and Biden being like completely insane has really taken off over the last 12 months. Um, and I think that part of you know the reason why people tuned in was in part to basically confirm either their priors or to just see whether or not that's true and i think that one of the narratives that makes sense in terms of why we've seen such a reaction from this speech is the idea that the republicans have it seems like at every subsequent step in this campaign they have tried to optimally fuck themselves in the most incredible way possible in terms of their chances of winning and this is an example where I actually thought their strategy was great. Make Biden seem crazy. Make him seem like he's got dementia. People aren't going to want to vote for somebody who's demented, right? But what somebody pointed out was that the Republicans effectively have set such a low bar for Biden doing anything right. That, hey, this is some crazy guy with dementia who's stumbling over his words, slurring his speech, falling off bikes, tripping all over the place. The fact that he's able to actually, oh, it turns out he doesn't have dementia. It turns out he can give you know a speech for an hour and a half and not sound like a complete lunatic. People immediately react and say, oh, well, he's he's just simply not as bad as I was told by Fox News. And it turns out he sounds just like ah, pretty much any other president we've ever heard of. He's just really, really old. Right. Which is still kind of a problem. But certainly I think that can explain part of the uh, 
relatively substantially positive reaction. It seems like pretty much every independent Democrat says oh, it was a pretty good speech. And some proportion of maybe Nikki Haley voters or something say, ah, oh, this guy sounds uh, all right, right? Yeah. So, Stax, I know you've got uh, family members and friends uh, up in the uh, the region where you live who are, are anti-Biden. Do you think that maybe the Very state of the union... Yeah. Do you think the yeah, state of the union I mean, maybe pulled them over? <laughs> I doubt it. But I, I do think that this is... Uh, honestly, it's... Uh, well, the thing is about this state of the union is I think it's it's it was so much more blatantly anti-Trump and anti-Republican than we've seen Biden in a while. Um, he did like through the majority of the state of the union, he consistently called out his predecessor as he referred to Trump. Um, just like not naming him explicitly, um, but also like taunting the the crowd of Republicans, um, MTG uh, after the, after the state of the union, but even during when the crowd was <clears throat> getting like really aggressive and things like that, he was taunting them in the middle of the speech. And I think that that plays really well to uh, the liberal base who, needs to be reminded a little bit about how awful Trump was. I think that we have a really collective short-term memory as uh, a nation and remembering what Trump was like um, and what Trump did. Uh, I think I think Biden did a really good job of highlighting that. Yeah, so he was criticized, obviously, during the speech that, that people said, listen, this was the most partisan uh, State of the Union address ever uttered. It was divisive. <laughs> it was aggressive. And I don't know if I entirely disagree with that. Uh, obviously, they say divisive in the pejorative sense. But I'll be, I mean, we'll see, again, how this bears out in the long-term polling. Because, again, to my point, and to an Econoboy or an Opisco reiterated, you know, there's no guarantee that this will manifest itself in sort of a permanent uptick, right? Because, again, historically speaking, it's just not been the case, even for other presidents. States of the Union, if delivered well, tend to poll high. And then it just kind of tapers out to reflect what the, the pre-state of the union average was. It's probably to be the case here. But for me personally, as somebody who has wanted Biden to take a much more aggressive posture uh, and kind of just match the times, uh, I like this because Biden, I think, has been one of the most reticent to, I guess, accept the fact that the era of bipartisan rhetoric – Right. Even though he got quite a bit done legislatively in a bipartisan way in terms of the let's just all get along for the sake of the country, that rhetoric is dead and it may not mm. come back. And I feel that Biden, to my frustration, was one among the, the slowest to get with a program. And so I feel like in the past couple of weeks from reports that I've read, um, he did an interview with The New Yorker. You had the State of the Union. Um, you even have his campaign speeches. Uh, d starting in January of this year, he has been he's been on Trump's ass. He's been calling mm -hmm. Trump by his least favorite word, which is loser. Like he's taking a much more aggressive posture. So what do you all think about that? Do you think that that's good? Do you think it's bad? Do you personally like it, but you think it's bad <laughs> politics? What 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 is your position? Christopher Hitchens once said politics is division by definition. And uh, I on the one hand, recognize that there are important bipartisan things that presidents and any member of the political branches should seek to get done. For example, the uh, sort of some of the historic packages that were passed um, to say nothing of other legislation that sort of didn't get through everyone's radar necessarily, but I'm thinking now about the um, bipartisan electoral count reform act, things like that. Um, so there are genuine tangible things that we need bipartisanship for. At the end of the day, these are the political branches. Am I offended or surprised that Biden was political? No. Um, I, I don't really uh, see much value, especially in this day and age, for the president just being this meek and mild uh, nonpartisan person on that stage. Um, and, and the sort of questions about decorum, I think, are totally lost now in the era of Trump. <laughs> Um, and the sort of opposition that he was he was heckled multiple times, say nothing of Marjorie Taylor Greene. And so those don't really ring true to me. They kind of ring a little hollow, frankly. And if you look at any other uh, country, I think about like the UK, for example, you look at their uh, question time. They're all partisan. They're always partisan. That's These are the political branches. Now, I understand the president is different than the prime minister. He's supposed to rise and speak for the nation as a whole. And in recent memory, I think Biden has tried to make overtures to that effect. But if they're falling on deaf ears from MAGA, I don't think that he has an obligation to to play into this one sided uh, rhetoric game. Do Donald Trump said that Ted Cruz's wife was ugly 
and that his dad killed JFK. Do- Donald Trump has said Biden is demented and doesn't know what he's doing. Biden said John McCain was a bad war hero because he was captured and he didn't actually do anything, you know, heroic, I guess. Yeah, he's like, my, I prefer my war heroes to not be captured. <laughs> yeah, right. Like he the Republican, any Republican who ever utters the phrase Joe Biden's too partisan needs to look into a fourth dimensional mirror to just do- delve into their own mind to understand the incredible hypocrisy because in in the current dimension that we live in they're clearly unable to do it but it's just unbelievable that i can hear a republican utter the phrase joe you know that joe biden guy he's too partisan his rhetoric is too extreme who no, are yeah, you, you voting for sir right. who is your leader who's been yeah, your to, leader for the last decade come on now to put this in context just to put some names to us you have people like newt gingrich newt freaking gingrich who i believe Maybe not as much as Mitch McConnell, but was at least the genesis of he's the up Repu- there. Yeah, the Republican obstructionism that we've seen. Sure. I think I think Gingrich was the one who you know tipped that first domino over during the Clinton administration. The McC- McConnell ran with it, but you have people like Newt Gingrich. You have Kaylee McEnany and others as well saying, you know, are they are are people really going to vote for this angry old man in November? Or are they going to go for Joe somebody Biden's who's striving for- the country? He's yes, dividing the country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um. It's one of these things that, that really frustrates me, as as Stax knows, because it's something I've bitched about incessantly, publicly <laughs> and privately to him. Because because Stax, I don't want to misrepresent him. Stax, I know I bust your chops where, where I say that you want me to be nice to conservatives. But well, like, but so, so no no no. So, there's a okay. there's a distinction that I make. I think that if you want to reach conservative civilians, I think that we should recognize that they're largely not um, vindictive. And they're they're and that, that's something that, that that's the rhetoric that I talk a lot about, like when I make videos. But there, I think there's a, a huge distinction when we look at conservative politicians, people like McConnell or obviously Trump. I think actively engage in vic, like who who engage in who are vindictive, if that makes sense. And I think that that's that should be called out for the rhetoric that it is. Yeah. Well, I think Biden does, generally speaking, a good job of I think it's I think it's always fine to be harsh on your political, your direct political opponents. Mm -hmm. And I think at the point where and to be fair, like could be wrong. Now, now, I don't know about you guys. I've heard a lot of Republicans say Democrats like Democrats are groomers and Democrats want to trans the kids and Mm -hmm. Democrats do this and that. I don't personally hear a lot, a ton of politicians on the Democratic side say Republican voters Republicans. Now, Biden did. He took a baby step in that direction by MAGA saying Republicans. MAGA Republicans. Right. But at the same time, I think it would be probably more appropriate if like, you know, if Republican politicians wanted to say, um, you know, the, the socialist Democrats or something are saying this or that. Like, obviously, that's the extreme wing of the party. And so for us to say, well, hey, the MAGA Republicans who say who most of whom say they would like if Trump was a dictator. Yeah, that's probably like a toxic base of people. But you're totally right, Stackham. Like when you're talking about average sort of suburban mom type, you know, conservative leaning people, I don't really think that these people, you know, contain a lot of the negative vitriol from Biden. Biden's typically careful to talk about specific political opponents. And then he did give the one speech where he talked about like the MAGA Republican movement. But in that same speech, he talked about how, you know, the the, the MAGA Republican movement is a is a is a diversion from the like right. normal Republican movement. And that, yeah, if anything, um, he was too charitable. You're talking about the independence. <laughs> no, that's exactly about the, right. The, the 2023 independence hall speech. Yeah. In Philadelphia. Sure. And he's, he's yeah. made, well, Oh, you mean made, Biden's Hitler speech? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Where he's, where the fuck it, oh, wait a minute. I should, you know what I should have done? Lights, Dark Brandon was born. <laughs> 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 <He's> wow. Just, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. No, but that's right. Like, I think, I think that if any, if any, and that's genuinely the case, like from from political commentators all the way down to um, or all the way up to the highest ranking politicians. Like, I don't I can't think of a a a broad and offensive attack such that um, the Republicans would call Democrats groomers because we support gay rights. I mean, that's yeah. just com- I mean, uh, completely ridiculous. It's very ugly. And I, I really honestly speaking, like, I just don't see the same type of vitriol from like the average democratic politician. You know, you might have some leftists on Twitter calling Joe Biden genocide Joe or something. But again, when we talk about sort of 
the 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 spiritual moral leaders of the movement um i, I just don't really see the same type of vitriol from democratic leaders as republican leaders Econobo, i love you and you know that and I, listen i my sympathies are always going to be with you um in any conversation about anything uh including and especially Democrats hold on pisco's Republicans. about to be wrong incoming but, <laughs> oh shit here we go but, <laughs> let me just be real i mean like one of the main things that uh voters threw back at hillary in 2016 was the basket of deplorables comment there there are t tons of examples like this we don't see them because we don't view them as particularly targeted in the same way that republicans have an ear for them but i i think both sides do it i'm not really going to get into the game of who does it more I, or less i think trump does it more uh, and it's more vindictive than Biden for sure. But in terms of the respective parties, what I have a problem with is when it crosses a line from the political arena into potential abuse of power. So there are realms in which I think that Biden should be apolitical. He should not be dictating the Department of Justice. If we were to find out, for example, that he was pressuring the attorney general to go after Trump, even though I believe Trump needs to be prosecuted for his crimes, I would think that's inappropriate. I would think that's impeachable from Joe Biden. Can I ask you a quick clarifying question yeah. as to that, Pisco? So, okay. So we have no evidence, obviously, that President Biden has pressured or directed any of the the uh, like particular prosecutions I think that's fair. Yes. Uh, in, the, in the Department of Justice. But we have heard people say off the record or like on conditions of anonymity that Biden is pissed at certain aspects of Garland's performance. So do you count that like if basically if it gets exposed to the press that the president is displeased with his attorney general, do you consider that improper? No, I don't. If there were evidence that Joe Biden was like wanting that to be spread so that, the, so that it would be heard by the Department of Justice, if you could show, hey, I'm saying this, that I'm frustrated with you and I'm telling you this wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because I know you're going to release it out to the public. That would be one thing. And I would put that in the category of pressuring for sure. I'm not going to let you get away from your your malignant intent because you have this little cute way of doing it. Um, but I don't think that just people expressing what the president said to them um, it necessarily falls in that, into that category without more evidence that, hey, I want to have this message be delivered out to the public so that the Department of Justice actually changes what they're doing. And I think you have other kind of more substantive evidence of that where he didn't interfere with the her report. He, um, he didn't multiple, assert executive yeah, privilege. Yeah, He has stopped himself from directly interfering with prosecutions into his own son, some of which I think are highly suspect and questionable. Um, and, and not to say anything about the investigations into Trump where there's no evidence and the attorney general and others have spoken uh, on the record saying that there has been no pressure from the White House. And I appreciate that. Um, so I don't think that there's evidence of that. And I do think there's evidence of Trump doing that. And that's why I'm calling for a special counsel or an inspector general's report to find out what's going on with the Smirnov guy and what was the origin of that investigation and what role, if any, the DOJ or the uh, or Rudy Giuliani or any other agent of Trump had in the political persecution of any of the Bidens. Um, because I do not think that abuse of power is, is okay, no matter who's doing it. So before we, I mean, I do want to get into specifics about, again, Trump's legal situation and also the Supreme Court too. Sure, but yeah. I will say with respect to, you know, your response to a convoy, here's, here's my beef. Yes. The, the, the comment from Secretary Clinton back in the 20 in 2016, in which she referred to, she said, you know, there are two baskets of Trump supporters. You know, one basket is this, and then the other basket is, you know, a basket of deplorables. Here, here's my problem with that. <laughs> it's been eight years since that comment mm -hmm. has been articulated, and Republicans still won't shut the fuck up about it. Meanwhile, to a Conaboy's point, you can't go one week without a prominent Republican politician, be it Trump or Marjorie Taylor Greene referring to the Democratic Party as a party of groomers and pedophiles. And so my frustration is, it's like, I'm not saying that you can't wag your finger and say, you know, Hillary, you shouldn't have painted with such a broad brush, but Republicans do it more, do it more frequently, yeah. and more Republicans do it, period. So it's like from every vector and mode of analysis, the Republicans yeah. are objectively worse. And my my problem is they're graded on a curve. And I I... I can't abide that. That's something where I feel like we all have an obligation to point that out. Like, hey, listen, if you're going to clutch your pearls about civility politics, fine and fair enough. But let's not pretend that Democrats are worse yeah. than Republicans or even as bad. So I feel like any honest accounting or any uh, honest reckoning of the in uncivil language used occasionally by Democrats, it has to be met with, OK, Republicans do it more, more Republicans do it, and Republicans say worse shit. Hillary Clinton said 50% of Trump supporters are deplorables. 
Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying all Democrats are groomers and pedophiles. All is worse than 50 and groomers and pedophiles is worse than deplorable. Hey, hey, listen, uh, so. your point is well taken. And that's where my intuition is as well. The only thing is I want to make sure the audience is aware my ear is tuned for it because I am left wing and because I do support Joe Biden. And so I have an ear for the kind of comments that I would think are absolutely in that category. But all I'm saying is I don't come from the vantage point necessarily of the Republican or the MAGA Republican who can feel very ostracized by some of the language that Democrats use. Not to say that that's justified or that it's equal on both sides, but just to <laughs> say, hey, both sides do it. And me, I only how, have an ear for did, what I have an ear for. How did Democrats get the reputation for being special snowflakes? I, I just I have to understand how how this happened, because how the hell is it that the average Republican politician is calling Democrats groomers and pedophiles and this and that? And we just take it. Oh, you know, whatever. Crazy Republicans. What are you going to do? They're the uh, they're the anomaly. Meanwhile, you say, hey, it seems like half of these Trump voters are actually pretty fucking crazy in terms of the shit that they believe. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, my goodness, you're <laughs> dividing the country. I can't believe you would say such a thing. MTG's running ads with guns shooting at Democrats and <laughs> policy proposals. We have multiple Republican congressmen calling for national divorce. I, I just I like it to, to, you know, to uh, what do you call it? To Josiah's point, like, I just think it's 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 not unreasonable to say, I understand I'm a Democrat. I understand I'm a left leaning person. But it just really feels like there's a serious double standard in how we evaluate people's rhetoric. I mean, we talk about grading Trump on a curb. No doubt. Um, John Oliver, he made the point early on in, in uh, Trump's uh, presidential campaign that uh, Trump, it's almost like a bed of nails. He says so many crazy things. He says yeah. so much stupid shit that it just kind of uh, horizontally distributes out. And that means that each subsequent sort of marginal impact of what he says go down. I totally understand that that psychological nature of what he's saying. But we but we can't discount like how incredibly fucking crazy the Republicans have become relative to the neocon movement, relative to the Tea Party movement, relative to the, the Gingrich era sort of Republican landslide. It's a it's a it's it's quite a different base and a quite a different sort of uh, stock of politician that we have today. I, On that, I totally agree, Kano Boy, in terms of the general things that the MAGA Republicans are saying versus the general things that uh, Democrats and left wing people are saying. I totally agree. I think it's uh, any Republican who supports Trump after what happened with with him trying to steal the election. I think w I would put in that camp of this is beyond the pale. This is just uh, gross. It's disgusting and worse than maybe anything anything de democrats have said in recent memory um so just supporting trump because of what he happened in the um in the 2020 election so on the general positions viewpoints of MAGA republicans i totally agree i was limiting my comments more of like the aspersions made of the other side and i agree on my ear i hear it more and i think that it's worse in nature and more in um in uh in time by the other side i just know that i have a feeling which is there i've spoken with republicans and maga people who are very sensitive and to your point about the snowflake um very sensitive to certain comments that might seem anodyne to like us but to them meant a lot and was really painful but again not to justify it anyway just given the other perspective yeah i, I mean I, I just want to make a comment that i like the bed of nails analogy is very potent to me like i do think that this is the third presidential election where Donald Trump is the leading Republican nominee. And nine years ago, all of his comments seemed crazy and insane. And how often did you hear, oh, this is this is going to be the, the nail in the coffin for Trump. And I think that we've all just been, been so numb to his insane rhetoric and insane policies. And I, like, I, I don't know what else to say, like crazy personality traits as well, like the, the cult leaders that just follow him around. Um, I, I don't well, you don't know. like just... the my pillow guy? <laughs> he saved someone. Right, right. Don't let, let him. Don't let him do fully. A fun pause. Can we do a fun pause? I want everyone's sure. um, most. I don't know if this is self-reporting or like your favorite MAGA personality that you love, even though you understand they're MAGA, they're crazy, but you love them for some reason. Honestly, Mike Lindell, just is because. Your and, and honestly, I despise really? the guy like most MAGA cultists until I saw him. He did an interview with Jimmy Fallon where he's standing in a claw machine, like a giant claw machine thing, and he's making fun of himself. And it was actually like after that, and I was talking with Luke Beasley about this, like I, I don't know where I was on, on Lindell prior to that, if he was like deliberately grifting or if he himself in a way is a victim of Trump. And I actually err more towards the victim thing, not to absolve him from culpability because he also signal boosts 
Trump's lies, but I get the impression that Mike Lindell is genuinely mentally unwell and was a genuinely <laughs> cheerful person prior to MAGA. So I don't know. I, I he's probably the one I mean, where I'm just like, oh, for, for me, it's it's I, to, for me, it's got to be Rudy Giuliani. And the reason I say Rudy, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Because, the reason I say Rudy is not only because he's completely insane, but also because you have to th like with Rudy, you have to think to yourself, like, how could it get lower? Right. How could his reputation and his legacy be destroyed even more than it is today? But then the next day happens and he finds a way like he finds a way to just completely topple any amount of legitimacy or legacy he ever could have had. I mean, because we have to remember, like Rudy Giuliani, he was the guy who ended the mob in New York. And he was the 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 the, 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 the America's mayor during 9-11. America's mayor. That, that was the phrase that I was looking he for. pioneered America's Rico, mayor. you know, you know he exactly right like this was this was a genuinely at one point a relatively broadly beloved uh, politician um and into his just by the way hang on pisco by the way as an attorney admires rudy giuliani just considers what just, what? Just, Wait, what i mean looks up to giuliani considers him like the gold Excuse standard me? of the legal profession just to kind of boy's point i'm just saying i okay. look i've heard pisco say that before but like yeah. you know we've all heard it but like that's the thing like about a lot of th that's the thing about trump and his his almost utility to the to the political process is that I think that Trump has shown above anything else. And, and we don't know this about Democrats because we haven't had quite the test that the Republicans have had, to be fair, um, which it could be the case with Democrats one day. But I think what he showed is that there's a lot of politicians and we always we, we knew this in the back of our heads that are really just completely fucking liquid in terms of their positions. Like they will fill whatever cup they need to in order to win and and fit the form that they need to. I mean, look at look at guys like Lindsey Graham. Oh. You know, he started out as super anti MAGA. He's an example like Rudy Giuliani, where when you said was Giuliani seeing, was liquid, Economo, I thought you meant when he was melting at his uh, die. Well, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Like Giuliani's the best case of 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 being like a sad person who's flip flopped, but he's also like a really embarrassing person. Like he seems like he can't go outside without embarrassing himself. But there's so many politicians like that. I mean, look look at a. Look at Chris Christie, right? Who uh, he's trying to save face now, saying he was super anti MAGA. Oh, look, I ran this campaign talking about I hate Trump, this and that. But, you know, who was one of the most major endorsements that dropped out in 2016? It was Chris Christie. I believe it was after he lost New Hampshire. You know, he endorsed mm. Donald Trump um, very fervently. And, well, a different time, you can say what you want, but like we can even look at the interpersonal relationship that they had where like there's clips of, of uh, you know, tr one thing about Trump is that he's very, um, he doesn't like when anyone else steals the spotlight. Um, and he doesn't like, uh, like particularly with Chris Christie, it was reported that uh, one of the reasons why he didn't pick Chris Christie to be his vice president was not only because Chris Christie had a strong personality, but also because Chris Christie was fat. And he felt like Chris Christie would make him look bad because he's he's so fat. And um, there were speeches where Chris Christie would introduce Trump and Trump would literally tell him, yeah, get out of here like that. Like, just get out of here right after the speech was over. Yeah. And Chris I mean, Christie's can... and Chris really quick. And Chris Christie's response was, you got it. And it's like, dude, you guys are all <laughs> yeah. cowards. And Donald Trump showed how cowardly the average politician is when they're faced with a crazy popular political figure that the that's average politician... That's why you like Giuliani? Well, no, no. That's why I think Trump provides utility to the political process. Oh. It shows just how cowardly the average politician will be. And to some extent, it's a reflection of our democratic system. But it, it's 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 sad how many Republicans who were good, strong Republicans, even Mitt Romney, who, who was going to dinner with Trump because he thought he would become Secretary of State? Mitt Romney was. And so no matter... All these Republicans, I think, are willing to you know, take whatever they need to in order to get a position of power. Um, and the Democrats might be the same way. We just haven't had quite the same test as as the Republicans have. You know, maybe one day Kanye West will be our our nominee <laughs> and we'll have to <laughs> really reckon with that. But, you know, until then, uh, it won't uh, be a Democrat. Uh, I promise you that. Yeah. I mean, un until then, Trump uh, Trump proves, uh, I think, uh, quite just just how paper thin the principles are of the average politician, at least in the Republican side. What about you, Stacks? Um, I would probably say, I don't know if Alex Jones counts as a MAGA personality, yes. probably yeah. because yeah. I he, like, he wasn't a part of the administration at all, but, um, I, I don't know. I watch his, I watch a lot of Republican shows. Um, you know, I tune into Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson every once in a while, and there is single handedly none that is more entertaining than Alex Jones. I also think he has 
I, I think he wraps around the other side where he actually provides a lot of utility for leftists because they can just point to the him and go, look at this insane human being. And they go, yeah, obviously the right's insane. Like, I think he provides so much. Like, Ben Shapiro seems really logical and really thoughtful. And a lot of the big conservative pundits seem to as well, uh, or seem to, right? Emphasis on seem to. But I think Alex Jones is so obviously single-handedly insane that he's a really good uh, person to just point to. Um, and uh, yeah, I I have watched a couple of his shows for fun. Uh, speaking of wrapping around, <laughs> so I, I do want to toss it back to you because sure. I know we have to talk about things. But speaking of wrapping around, my favorite MAGA personalities are the MAGA rappers uh, who like, do you, have you seen them on Twitter? Where they'll, yeah. they have yeah. the are we talking about Tom, Tom McDonald? Or? I don't know their names, but I do oh, know okay. that there are many MAGA like hip hop rappers. And they recently did a video. It was like, we are the world type video with like Michael Flynn. And it was so deliciously awful. Um, so those are my <laughs> favorite MAGA personalities. But Desire, sorry to interrupt. No, no, listen. Um, I, I mean, uh, we are the world with Michael Flynn. Uh, Jesus. Uh, so what's funny is I actually watched a, a good We Are the World documentary on Netflix. They actually recorded the fucking thing in a single night. It's, it's amazing. Really? And so now I'm imagining all like the behind the scenes corralling involved in a MAGA rap video. Tom McDonald's the one who did Ben Shapiro. That yep. with ben Shapiro, right? Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, also, to be fair, I, I'll defend my Rudy Giuliani pick as well. Um, Rudy Giuliani has the most has the record for, I think, the most bizarre video in the history of politicians, which was which one? Um, Giuliani dressed in drag. And I believe uh, mm. with Trump <laughs> and I believe yes, Giuliani yeah. and I believe. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yes. Trump. No, yeah, Trump motorboated Giuliani dressed in drag like 20 years ago. <laughs> that this happened. is a real you video. You haven't seen that, Josiah? No, I've not real, seen that. No. Actual this is real. Yeah. Thing that happened. And it is one of the most bizarre. It's just funny to think, man, that's those guys, that Trump was the president. He'll be the president 20 years after that video. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. So f I thought you were talking about the. Uh... Oh, go sorry. Ahead. I, no, I think ahead. you're talking about the uh, the Sasha Baron Cohen. That's the one I was yeah. thinking where he's playing pocket pool. No, this you know? is yeah, Giuliani yeah, in full crazy. drag, in full I've drag as yeah. a drag queen going up to Trump and Trump motorboating him. Or well, sorry. listen, thank God he wasn't trying to read a book to kids. Otherwise, Republicans wouldn't know what to do, right? If he was in drag, <laughs> drag time story hour. The original drag queen. Original. Yeah. Well, Giuliani probably has to read. I'm not sure if he can do so at this point because that guy has been, let's see, he's suffered, hasn't he suffered multi-million dollar judgments, Pisco? Oh, yeah. Um, he's actually, well, I think he's in a bank bankruptcy proceeding. So a lot of these, um, when there's, I don't know anything about bankruptcy. You should not, you should get your own bankruptcy he's, lawyer. I don't know anything about it. not allowed to practice anymore uh, right? in, <laughs> in New York. Was well, he, was he, he had some department proceedings. I actually don't know if, now I'm not remembering if they were, if they've been completed yet. But a lot of the cases have been, shunted over to the bankruptcy court because basically when you go bankrupt a bunch of your cases will get funneled before the bankruptcy court um again i'm not a bankruptcy attorney go get your own but uh so the, the idea is like a lot of the defamation stuff um and other related civil actions have been um are still ongoing and he has a bunch of judgments against them that he is not paid yeah, he he jumped the shark as far as I'm concerned when yeah that four seasons press conference was four seasons <laughs> landscaping. That's I mean, just such oh a such a beautiful iconic oh, Rudy Giuliani moment. It's That's crazy a, how much of Trump's presidency. Sorry to interrupt, no keep going. It's it's crazy how much of Trump's presidencies were like had some aspect of like a genuine like comedy routine to it. Like there are a couple of his quotes which like genuinely made me laugh out loud. Like when he he asked, he was talking to the five year old on Christmas, and he like. Said still he still believes believe believe in Santa. <laughs> he's like, legitimately the no, most quotable president there has ever been. It's so good, like, the, like Teddy Roosevelt and FDR. Like he for real is the most quotable. And no, yeah. Cool. Well, you're comparing him to like you know again. All we have to fear is fear itself, and ask not what you or what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And then we have Trump going, you know, this hurricane was one of the wettest in terms of water ever on record. <laughs> point of water. Yeah. I mean, yeah, from the standpoint of water, at least. Oh. You mean, <laughs> yeah, see, that's, you know, that's the other thing that, that kind of frustrates me. Like when we're talking about, you know, which MAGA personality is the standout and chats like coming up with a gazillion, cause it really is hard. Cause you've got, you've got half of the Republican Congress right now. You've got Tim Scott, you've got Lindsey Graham, you've got Ted Cruz, you've got Marjorie Taylor Greene, you've got Lauren Boebert, et cetera, and so forth. Each of whom could have their own, like we could devote an entire episode to their hypocrisy and their craziness and their spinelessness. But then also, um, 
just for for Trump in general, you know, they're again going back to him being graded on a curve. The thing for Biden State of the Union that the bar was so lower that he just had to clear it in terms of delivering a speech effectively because there's so many questions about his mental acuity. But the thing that I keep telling people, because I feel like we have ceded the ground to this, is that poll after poll after poll shows that a majority of Americans, not to the same extent, but have serious questions about Trump's mental fitness. And, you know, then it gets back to we're talking about Trump quotes. I mean, I I don't know. I know Trump was highly educated. I think he went to Wharton. Was that right? Did he go to Wharton School of Law That's or right. something like that? Yeah, Business. I think he got a BA. Oh, business? Yeah, yeah he had what? a business degree. So I'm sure the guy is not like an like an idiot, you know, in terms of like IQ or whatever. But everyone C's who's get ever degrees, worked for boys. Him, say what? True. C's get degrees, boys. Never forget. Very true. Touche. But like everybody who's worked for Trump in a reasonable, like in a meaningful capacity when he was president, like his like former chiefs of staff, secretaries of state, they all say he's an idiot and that he's yeah. profoundly uncurious and. The guy is a gaff machine as much as Biden. So to me, that's the other frustrating thing is that's a yeah. double standard manifest there. Who's Trump says on a curve now. Exactly. Sorry, I just think Trump is yeah. Trump is so much worse. I don't know. I mean, I, I've had some crazy stuff he's done. I mean, I knew people in the uh, intelligence world who said that it was uh, it was extremely difficult to brief Trump. That like Trump had it was it was hard to basically get him to understand anything and pay attention to anything. He like very uncurious, like you said. Um, he, there was that, that I think it was in his first few days as president. He, he instituted a policy where um, his briefs had to be one page and they had to have lots of pictures yeah. <laughs> because he was just he just really genuinely like speaking pictures. is well, genuinely speaking, like he's not. And to be fair, like I, I don't think Trump is like a, a bumbling idiot. I had a I had a conversation with my conservative friend and he said um, he said, you know, look, I think uh, he said I think Trump's probably above average IQ. And I was like, that's definitely not true. But I wouldn't say he's like a bumbling idiot. I would say maybe he's like a standard deviation below the rest of us. Like he's just kind of stupid. Um, and I think that when people can a lot of times people will make the fair comparison. They'll say, you know, look at a look at a video of Biden talking from 20 years ago and look at a video of Biden talking today. And they'll say, Look, Biden's just a lot slower. Like he, he's he's thinking slower. He's not thinking as quickly. He's not as sharp as he used to be. And that's like undoubtedly true. I think if you compare and contrast Biden when he was 60 to Biden when he's 80 today, there's definitely a difference. But at the same time, if you look at a video from Trump when 20, 40 years ago, there is also a clear difference. Trump from the 1980s sounds extremely articulate mm -hmm. compared to what he is today. And again, I, I'm not comfortable saying he has dementia, but like, you know, when you're I mean, fuck, when you're almost 80 years old, almost everyone's going to be a little bit slower than they used to be. Right. I mean, that's just kind of a natural part of aging. Thank I mean, you. you can't you can't say that he has dementia because he remembered five words on a test he took six years ago. TV, woman, person, elephant, yeah. person. Yeah. But like he yeah, it's, it's fascinating because, again, I've made this. Oh, yeah. oh, I love it. Wanna, hold on. I love that part where he's like, he's like, I got the best score on the mental <laughs> test. And it's like it's and, it's, you know, they say it's a difficult test. They say it's a difficult <laughs> test. And then the, the I think it was like CNN that was like, this was the test. And it was like, which one of these is, is a giraffe? <laughs> one of them <laughs> is like, what is the date today? <laughs> it's, literally, it's literally Peter Griffin with the easier questions. And that one, get, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, yeah, for literally. real. Yeah. For real. It's I mean. Because it's, it's not a, it's not an IQ test, right? It is literally to test if to you test have if you are mental yeah, yeah mentally challenged. I don't know or the if you have some sort of like way yeah yeah. But if you if you have some sort of cognitive impairment like related right. to dementia or Alzheimer's, right? And so the 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 thing is though, if you go back, like you said, you, you don't even have to go like you go back and watch Conan O'Brien interviews or Oprah Winfrey interviews or Larry King interviews with Donald Trump in even the early aughts there is a noticeable change because I'm with you. I mean, I don't deny the fact that Biden is clearly, you know, he suffers from some sort of age related slowness. Right. But I, again, I don't think it's, I don't think it's dementia or Alzheimer's or anything else. He's just, he's, Look he's at your an old guy. Those are deep state euphemisms. Right. That's right. Exactly. I'm reading off the note card right now. No, no, they, they, they would never, the deep state like would never permit this. Right you mean brainwash. <laughs> I am off. I am. I am outside of the line. I'm. I'm coloring outside the lines right now by even saying this. But the question is whether there's competence there. And for me, if Biden is has lost a step in terms of verbal agility, um, you know, I think it was Lawrence O'Donnell who said on MSNBC a couple of weeks ago that, you know, believe it or not, we don't elect presidents specifically to make 
speeches. They are head of state, right? So speech making and trying to unify right. the country, that is important, but they are chief executive first, right? So they're an administrator, they're, they're head of government first and foremost. And so for me, I'm the question take a is- a little issue with that there, pondering, I love you. And I mean, all right, go ahead, what's I, up? And listen, I, I totally agree that part of being a good president it absolutely is policy and getting good people in charge. But I would say a huge part of it, not an insignificant part, a huge part is rallying the country and putting forth your vision and getting the country on board and on the same page. Because frankly, there's it's a unified head of state who, when the time calls for it, needs to be able to speak candidly to the American people and get them on board for policy ends. So, so in other words, you could have the best policy in the world, but if you can't get the people on board, what use is it? Or you could have the best results in terms of the bipartisan infrastructure, most investment, all that stuff. And I agree with all those policy achievements. And part of the, the struggle has been for the administration to properly, I think, sell them their, their record. But if you cannot communicate that to the American people, what good are you? Um, in other words, perception in some ways is reality. And so I do think that Biden's, even though I would vote for Biden if he couldn't talk, if he was mute, if he was, like, uh, you know, over over Trump, right? Um, because I think of Trump is such an existential danger. But I think that uh, any kind of problem in communication is a substantive criticism because a huge part of the role is communication with the American people. So I'm not, I'm, let me, let me, let's try to parse this out. So again, as head of state, yes, there is a communicative, communicative element there, but I don't, I don't take it as far as I feel like a lot of people do, which they evaluate the strength of Biden's presidency based on his ability to give off the cuff answers or how often he does interviews. Sure, yeah. I want to be very clear about this. Biden in my in my estimation, or any president, let's be very clear, any president in my estimation would still be fulfilling their obligations as head of state, head of government, and commander in chief of the armed forces if they gave one interview a year. Because we have an entire apparatus devoted to communicating the president's agenda to the American people. You have a press secretary, you have surrogates and things like that. In fact, as a matter of fact, if I see the president in front of a camera every day conducting interviews, it's like, buddy, you need to be in the fucking situation room. You need to be behind the resolute desk. I don't want I don't need to see you all the goddamn time the way Trump was omnipresent. And that's that to me. To me, Trump was an overcorrection as somebody who was a performer rather than an executive. And you can also tell based on how little he aged. That was something that was brought up recently, too, which I thought was an excellent point. Trump. Has did not physically age during his presidency, and that's how you know that he was not, you know, actually engaged in the substance of running the country. And so, to me, I, I, I hear you. Communication is important, but I would rank or if I have to choose between a competent executive and a competent communicator, executive comes first, communicator is a distant second. I think I would. I think I'd agree with that. Uh, I'm just gonna get a little pushback a because I, I I do think that Biden has has had some uh, failings in communicating. Um, some of what the great things that he's been doing. And so I, or if, if it's not him, it's his surrogates, or if it's not them, it's uh, maybe the media not reporting it. Someone's, someone's it's responsible because the message is not getting through, right? Econo boy, isn't the economy yeah. on the rebound? Aren't well, we like, doing better? I, I think, I think a good way to put it is that being a, being a strong public speaker is probably like a necessary, but not sufficient condition to be a holistically good president because at the end of the day, I, I really don't. I mean, unfortunately, for the people out there who just cannot speak or who are mute or who are deaf and can't speak uh, very well, um, you know, compared to someone who doesn't have a hearing impairment or something like that, I probably don't really I, I really don't see a future for anybody like that to be elected to be president um, because communication is is pretty important. And of course, that's very ableist of, you know, the average American voter, of course, that shouldn't be the case. Um, but I would say that certainly it is the case that if if you're not a strong communicator, you, you could have the best ideas in the world. You could, you know, generally speaking, I mean, you, you, you could be the best president ever if people would actually elect you. Um, but if you can't communicate in an effective way, you're, you're, you're probably just never going to get there. Right. Um, and I think that Biden and Biden and Trump have their own sort of, uh, I would say, strengths and weaknesses in terms of their communication ability um, in general. So it's it's not it's not like clear that it's not clear to me that when they speak, uh, Biden or Trump like particularly win over people compared to the other one, right? So they do when they're funny, and I think one of the best parts about now, if we if we're getting to the speech, uh, the substance of it, yeah, uh, I think Biden was funny, um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why I at least thought the speech was very good. Uh, and if we're grading anyone on the curve, if we're grading Biden on the curve in this public speaking, 
I thought it's a really great speech, like a fantastic speech as far as Biden is concerned, because he doesn't always have the most. Um, and even then he had some difficulty sometimes in fluidity and getting everything across, but he was able to extemporaneously respond to like dissent and to heckles and stuff that sounded really good and in a really funny way. And I think that we need to see more of that because Trump can also be very funny and can also extemporaneously come up with these like little funny asides. And I think that people relate to that. They, they think that like they're more human if they're able to do those. That's why I thought Katie Br or Senator Britt's um, response was so alien. Maybe it resonated with some people, people and I'm just like <laughs> totally in a bubble. I don't want to out stacks, but he said he was a huge fan of it. You I love this speech. It. You love this speech. <laughs> All right, give us your taste. Stacks. What? One of those aliens. No, I'm joking. Oh, yeah, um, no, he hated it. <laughs> <laughs> But I, but yeah, to your point, I mean, there was also a few interviews that he did after the State of the Union. Where, I mean, when he made that face to Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene, and that kind of went a little viral because everyone saw, I think everyone recognized him as kind of one of those, like one of your old grandpas who would just like make fun of the the kids who were acting a little silly. Um, but like in a, in a kind of like disparaging way still um, to Marjorie Taylor Greene. And I, I don't know, I think that he has put on a new... Um, I don't know. He, he has a little bit of a new face recently. And I think that he stepped into this job really hoping to be a bridge builder. And I think that something that might have radicalized him a bit is what happened with the border deal, where Republicans said that they wanted something and then voted against it. And it I think that resonates with speech. him. It was a good moment yeah. in speech yeah. as well, because I, I think that there, in terms of substance, there's not much ground for MAGA conservatives to stand on in mm -hmm. the critique of this bill, in my opinion, as someone who has done at least a little bit of immigration in their pro bono, actually quite a, a few cases, um, I know that there are exceptional powers that the president have has, but one of the most, like, I would say radical things that this bill proposed was just this, um, like, proceduralist throwing people back across the border. Um, and being able to, ex you know, remove people summarily, that is a power mm -hmm. that is incredibly, incredibly strong. And because usually even if once you yeah. cross the border, you're in America and you're entitled to certain procedures, even if it's expedited removal procedures, you're going to be heard in front of an administrator. And maybe you can even appeal it to an administrative judge, um, even if you are in the, the worst cases. Right. This is talking about just throwing people back across the border. Um, it's a huge power. And um, Biden you know, he saw the bluff and he called it and it was a yeah. very, very strong bill. And the shot of, um, oh my God, I'm remember, I forget his name, Senator from Oklahoma, <laughs> Langford, Langford, Langford. Uh, of nodding along and saying, that's true. When Biden said that this would be an, like, it would help a lot with the border. That was a great moment for Biden. Well, yeah, yeah, where he's blinking in Morse code, like I would like <laughs> to be like cheering and raising my fist, but I can't. Yeah. Trump has me on a leash, so. Well, I think that he was beside like Senator Langford was beside himself uh, probably about as much as the Democrats were because he was he was relatively strong in defending the bill on the sort of conservative oh, yeah. merits um, on the news. And the bill still ended up getting shot down. I think that what can be said about Biden is that I think he did learn from his time as vice president that you really can't work with Republicans to an incredible degree like you could have in the 90s or in the in the 80s when you know he had he had taken office a little bit earlier on in his tenure. Because Biden, I mean, he immediately went for reconciliation uh, half a dozen times when he was in office uh, for the first two years with a unified government. And I think that that's a much stronger record to run on, frankly, than Obama had when he was running for re-election. Conaboy, to clarify, I'm sorry, when you say yeah. reconciliation, I'm curious because there's that procedural term reconciliation where you you basically pass a bill with just 51 yeah. votes. Or do you mean reconciliation as Politically, a sentiment? Like to, no, like to um, when... When he basically pushes forward huge spending packages and huge priorities through oh, the procedural, procedural reconciliation. Yes, gotcha. Yes. Um, <laughs> because, yeah. yeah, because um, like one thing that just completely plagued Obama's entire presidency was not taking advantage of that first two years to the mm -hmm. greatest possible extent where he could have he could have passed federal abortion protections. Right. He could have ended the filibuster. Right. He could have um, he could have been a lot more aggressive with pushing for Obamacare a lot earlier. He could have passed a bigger stimulus. He just didn't do all those things in the name of bipartisanship. How many Republicans voted for any of that? None. Right. It was just a complete waste of time. Um, and Biden, you know, he worked uh, even to get the bipartisan infrastructure built done early on in his presidency. But he also passed a lot of other stuff. And the reason I say that that's a stronger record to run on is because um, it shows you like holistically, like, hey, if you elect Democrats, not if you elect Republicans, if you elect Democrats to office, 
we can actually get a lot of shit done, right? Look at all the stuff he was able to get done, um, even with uh, Cinema and, and Mansion blowing a lot of shit up. Um, so I think that's a really strong... Uh, about, you want to hear the black pill, though? Here's the black pill. Give me the black pill. The black pill is between 2021 and 2024, the Republican Party has changed even more than it was in 2021. And I think if you had had the same bill up for consideration in 2021, it would have passed with Republican many Republican votes um, and enough to, to pass the filibuster. Yeah, I agree. And I think and I think since the start of Biden's presidency and the end of Biden's presidency and throughout all of Trump's presidency, the Republican Party has become more and more manga. There has not been a moment in the descent of the Republican Party into MAGAism since 2017, 16, 17, where yeah. there's been a reversal. It's always well, gone towards I mean, keep, keep in mind, like when we're talking about the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we're talking about like a handful of Republicans in the Senate voting for it. We're, we're not talking about a substantial number of House members. And, you know, that's been a trend basically from 2016 on where Trump has gone through a pretty deliberate filtering process where 2018, 2020, 2022, we saw wave after wave after wave of moderate Republicans being primaried by Trump endorsed candidates. And a lot of them ended up losing their general elections. But hey, in terms of the Republicans left around, the proportion of them that are like really crazy market conservatives is a lot higher. And so I totally agree with you, Pisco. Um, I think there's very little room for sort of anti-Trump Republicans in the Senate or the House anymore. Um, I think the I think literally the one sort of, or I, well, actually, I'll say the two structural exceptions would be uh, the senator from Maine or the senator from Alaska. Yeah. Um, because their categories they have their own. Yeah. Well, Calo, right? and well, Collins. Yeah. Because they have ranked choice voting, right? I think that that's the reason that you'll see maybe room for moderate senators from those states. But I think that in pretty much every other state, I, I really... Yeah, I, I don't think that this is a problem and also be deviated just, anytime soon. There's a bit of a mansion thing going on here, too, with Maine and, and Maine. Susan Collins is a bit of a known commodity. They know her and uh, they like her. Even liberal people in, in Maine like Susan Collins, uh, which is weird to me, yeah. uh, especially given how um, she voted and some of the Supreme Court nominees and what happened later with Roe v. Wade. Uh, but but yeah, it's still the case. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I'm sure if you pulled and, Maine, they like her. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right wingers have been trying to primary Lisa Murkowski for like 15 years now, and they, they haven't really been able to succeed. Yeah. Um, and so especially with the ranked choice voting, I mean, you know, Alaska has a Democrat in the House representing them. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, ranked choice voting really does help, I would say, at least in our current environment, like Agreed. moderate the, the type of candidates. And, and those are just the two states that have it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I agree that I, I don't really I, I think that and I don't know what happens after Trump, you know, if Trump decides, he, you know, say Trump if Trump wins, it's only going to get worse. But if Trump loses in 2024, I don't, I don't know if the Republican party will. I don't think come, there's a pivot coming. There's yeah. No I don't think it'll. Yeah. I think yeah, maybe 2032 that... or something like at some point it'll happen. Cause they're going to get 40% of the vote in a, an election and decide they just have to at some point. But this is the yeah, thing it's not though, happening the, the GOP soon. is not an introspective party. Cause this is the thing that frustrates me. I mean, I'm not saying that a, a some sort of epiphany is impossible, but to me, it's it's breathtaking that it hasn't happened yet because Trump won via the Electoral College, which is a legitimate win. But uh, there's no mandate associated with Trump and Trumpism. He lost the popular vote to Secretary Clinton by three million votes, won by the Electoral College. Then he lost in 2018. He lost in 2020, 2021 with the Senate runoffs. He lost in 2022, 2023. So it has been one L after another. And so like that's, you know, like I, I'll be on a WIC panel. Uh, sometime this week talking about is Trump good for the Republican Party? Objectively speaking, he's been terrible for it. You know, if you want to hang your hats on appointing those three Supreme Court justices, but that that was McConnell and the Federalist Society that had nothing to do. I, you could have put any Republican in Trump's position and they would have rubber stamped whatever uh, you know, appointment there. Andre, I, but he's playing a different game than you. He's not playing the game of general election wins. He's playing the game of primary wins. He's playing the the game of winning and dominating yeah. the republican party yeah but what but 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 my the problem is you still have to win the general and in trump's uh, yeah. under the under trump the republican party's record with that respect has been awful and so that that's the thing it's like that's where the gop's epiphany the fact that it's taken this long and hasn't happened mm. yet is really embarrassing that's why when people say well it's gotta you happen for, you mean for the non-trumpers who, who do care about winning and sure being yeah okay. well well quite frankly even for the trumpers as well right okay, like okay. this is the, like yeah. even for the trumper the maga republican 
I don't know why the fuck you care about winning a primary if you don't win the general. The primary doesn't get you the office that you're seeking. Who, so who gives a shit, right? So if if I'm a MAGA Republican and I and I just just nail the primary, but I lose to a moderate Democrat in the general, I still lost. The Democrats won, I lost. And so there's no matter no matter how you slice it, the inevitable road, at least so far, the record has reflected that it's just been one defeat yeah. after another. Unless you don't have a preference as between a moderate deep state Republican and a moderate deep state Democrat, which I, mean, I, I, think, I don't I think, think is true of all MAGA, but I think it's true of some uh, significant portion of MAGA. They have an indifference. They, they view the uniparty. They, yeah, they view it as a uniparty, part of the same swamp. And so if you're, you know, I don't really care if Mitt Romney or Joe Biden wins the election, because to me, there are two sides of the same coin. I think that yeah. the issue is that the reason I do say it's going to come to a head at some point is because I don't really see a reason to believe that the demographics of the country will become substantially more favorable or remain the same uh, for Republicans, even going into the next decade. Right. So, like, I think what, what I mean by that is I, when you look at the sort of political ideological bend of each generation, it seems like millennials and Gen Zers particularly are almost like stubbornly left leaning. Right. Where millennials are not becoming more concerned they're becoming slightly more conservative in the sense that they're becoming like far left democrats now they're moderate democrats but they're not becoming literally conservatives like gen xers and and uh, boomers have done at the same ages and that these curves are seriously discon discontinuous part of that could be growing up during the great recession part of that could be growing up during the tea party movement part of that could be growing up during obama and obama was such a inspirational political figure for so many young millennials at the time right i'm not really sure but the point is that seems to be the case. And I think especially in 10 years when you have like so many more boomers pass away and such a higher proportion of the voting base is going to be millennials. Like I think at some point there will be a presidential election where Democrats win 58% of the vote, win 60 Senate seats, win 300 seats in the House and literally pass like every conceivable Democratic priority. And the, the Republicans literally take such a fat L that they just have to change. They yeah. either face electoral annihilation or they have to change. And I don't know if that's 2032. I don't know if it's 2036, but it just seems like the demographics of the country just simply will not allow for this type of ideology to go forward into the future unless we see the younger generation, like basically all of a sudden become substantially more conservative than they are now, which it, they just aren't trending in that direction. So. Yeah. So real quick, I want to answer this question. Josiah, are you sure that he's objectively bad? How do you know the results wouldn't have been worse with another flag bearer? The reason that I think it's reasonable to conclude that Trump has been electoral poison for the GOP is because when you control, like you take his endorsements. So Trump makes a lot of lots of endorsements, but if you don't count incumbents uh, and you basically you count endorsements that Trump makes that are non-incumbent and deviate from what the establishment Republican Party recommend in terms of endorsements, Trump had a very high loss rate for candidates that he endorsed. Then you see as well with like more moderate Republicans doing reasonably well in swing districts. You have 18 relatively moderate Republicans in districts that President Biden won. So the general principle is, at least in this election, uh, the past few election cycles, is more moderate Republicans do better in the general election than MAGA Trump Republicans. I don't know. The uh, Arizona race hasn't been decided yet, but you have Carrie Lake, who was endorsed by Trump. She lost the, the gubernatorial race, and she's favored to lose the senatorial race too. She was favored to lose it in a three-way with Kirsten Cinema as the incumbent independent. But now that uh, Cinema is out of the the race and it's a two v or it's a one v one, she's favored to lose that as well. MAGA, as a general principle, just does not do well in general elections. And, and I'm not saying don't take it me. seriously. I'm just saying that this idea that he you know, he pitches himself as this like this reinvigorator of the GOP in certain respects he is, but in terms of winning elections, no, he's not. And if you want to, I guess fight against Josiah's point, my question would be, can you point to a single election where that, where you think that pattern hasn't been met, where you think, so for instance, point to a moderate Republican, I'm thinking now of all the 2022 elections in Pennsylvania and, and, and elsewhere. Well, that's a good question. Okay. So as between Dr. Oz and who was the candidate against, um, Doug Mastriano, Doug Mastriano, who would you consider to be more manga there? I mean, Mastriano. Mastriano for sure, yeah. Okay, but Oz is kind of like a little bit manga as well, right? And Oz is kind of a wild card because he's like a celebrity <laughs> style candidate like Trump. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I mean, to I, be fair, like, yeah. you know, Fetterman was kind of a wild card too. So, true. Yeah. I would be interested in elections in which there was both a manga candidate 
on the ballot and a less MAGA candidate and to see the comparison between the two and, and to point an example where Josiah's pattern hasn't held true. I think that would be an interesting um, I think there have been there have been some pocketed examples like um, for instance, if I'm not mistaken, I think New Hampshire is a decent exception to this where New Hampshire has quite a like Republican, like quite a moderate Republican in office. Same thing with Vermont. Now, to be fair, I don't think that they've faced like serious primary challenges, but um, I I want to say in the New Hampshire Senate election, this most recent one, um, I believe a MAGA Republican actually lost the primary to a more moderate one. But it, I mean, that's like the exception that proves the rule. Like it, mm. it does seem like to Josiah's point, it seems like certainly it's the case that if you are a Republican and you want to win your election, your first step is getting Trump's endorsement. And your second step needs to be trying to distance yourself <laughs> from Trump right. in the general election <laughs> so that you can actually win your election, um, which is, to be fair, I mean, that's something that, again, like, I don't think Mitt Romney is like the worst Republican on the planet, but like he falls into this where like he worked to get Trump's endorsement when he ran for Senate. Then after the primary, he immediately starts criticizing Trump. And now all of a sudden he feels bulletproof. We see this pattern happen a lot with um, different like these like uh, moderate Republicans that are still left where they still have to cater to Trump to some degree. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, no, no, 100 percent. They put themselves in a position more so, in my opinion, than at any point in modern U.S. history, the Republicans have where their incentives to win the primary and their incentives to win the general are in direct opposition. They're mutually exclusive. As, as a convoy says, you have to hug Trump to win the primary and then you have to haul ass from Trump to have a shot of winning the general just as a general principle. But at the end of the day, I, I'm not entirely sure that an epiphany is coming um, just because, again, to me, it's like there should have been one already. And you can need you need only look at McConnell. So Mitch McConnell, the longest serving, you know, Republican uh, leader in the Senate is resigning from leadership at, in November. And then he's not seeking reelection in 2027. And McConnell, to me, when there's going to be a postmortem on his political legacy, I'd like to see what you all have to say about this. Um they're going to, I think, as much as him reshaping the federal judiciary and as him as eroding senatorial norms, uh, I think he will be inextricably tethered to Donald Trump, politically speaking, because he made the cold and stupid calculus that he could direct Trump, use Trump, and then discard Trump when Trump was no longer politically viable. So I look at after January 6th, you know. When Democrats wanted to impeach then President Trump, they asked for a speedy trial in the Senate. And McConnell, even though in the days afterwards he emphatically blamed Trump for January 6th, didn't want to give a trial, right? Because he was mm -hmm. hoping to basically have his cake and eat it too. I don't want to make an opponent of Donald Trump yet. Uh, he thought he was person. defeated. It's like, right. the, the, without any spoilers, the mountain and the viper, for those of you who know that reference. Uh, one issue that I think a lot of Republicans and Democrats, and this is especially true of Democrats, is they underestimate their opponents. You can never underestimate your opponents. Don't be hysterical about, about Trump or anything, or MAGA or whatever. It recognizes it's a threat and don't underestimate them. Mitch McConnell thought Trump was done. A lot of Republicans thought he was done, but he wasn't done. He still drew breath, he stood up, and he now dominates the Republican Party. So don't, if you consider Mitch being an enemy of Trump, and I think in an interpersonal way, they are, they're vying for the structure of power in the Republican Party. Now, in the general sense, he's been an ally because he's um, been complicit in the rise of Trump and Trumpism, even while trying to manipulate and use it for his own ends. But he was defeated by Trump because he underestimated Donald Trump. Um, and so I think that everyone needs to stop underestimating this guy. This guy can absolutely win this election. And it's up to people um, really to convince uh, each other and of, of your friends. And, you know, Zach says he has a bunch of conservative family I members. Do. Maybe they're not reachable. But um... well, it's, I don't know if it's just <laughs> yeah. about underestimating Trump. It's also not about overestimating Republican primary voters. True, right? yeah. because I think I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately speaking, like what a lot of the analysis of like, like uh, I think Staxian mentioned it earlier, like how many times have we heard Trump is done after he said this, that and this. Yeah. Right? And yeah. the issue is that um, we have to keep in mind that Trump's sort of institutional capture is of the mind of the median Republican primary voter. Now, it's not necessarily of necessarily the mind of the median person who votes for a Republican in the general election. Right. But there's a reason why his endorsement is so valuable. It's because Republican primary voters are MAGA conservatives. 
And there's like a huge disproportionately representative population of them that participate in the primary that when you see polls that show that, um, oh, the, the Trump base is more enthusiastic than the Biden base, what that translates into is Trump has a lot more of a hold on, and Biden, to be fair, doesn't attempt to do this like Trump does, but Trump has a lot more of a hold on who can make it out of a Republican primary. And when we talk about all these cons all these crazy conservatives that got elected, every single one of them was voted for by Republican primary voters. That is who they prefer. Um, you know, I, I posted on Reddit. Um, it was a, I don't know, it was like a, it was like a, 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 pol a political thread or something. And it was like, uh, you know, why isn't why isn't Nikki Haley doing as well as Donald Trump? And it's like because Republican primary voters like Trump, they prefer him and his rhetoric and his insanity and his complete fucking crazy direction of the country. That's just what they want. Right. And, you know, oh, another sexist comment, another crazy thing Trump said, another crazy thing Trump did, another indictment, another fucking giant list of 100 things that Trump did that was crazy. This will be the time. This will be the moment when Republicans realize that Trump is crazy and vote against them. Like, no, it's not. They've already known this. That's that's priced in. Right. And we, and we can't necessarily assume that in the short term, any one of these events, even as extreme as January 6, is going to necessarily like, I mean, clearly fundamentally changed the opinions of Republican primary, mm. primary voters on Donald Trump. The, yeah, um, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stax, and then I'm going to change. No, yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard when we're talking about Republican voters, because I do think that I'm not exactly convinced that these are still that the that this is the same Republicans that voted for Bush in the early 2000s. Like, I think Trump tapped into this very silent um, you know, millions of people, millions of Americans who are incredibly conspiratorial, who feel like no party has their side and they heard Trump and they thought this guy's got my back. Um, so now Republicans have to fight essentially their go-to base who've had their backs for a long time, uh, against these kind of radical activists who are now cinched to the Republican parties and, and they have to grapple with this essentially divided base. Um, or at I least that's that, my take on Yeah, go ahead. I, I think it definitely is the same group of people. I, I think a substantial portion of the Republican Party has legitimately just become more right wing. Um, I think that you can see that in a lot of the exit polls for Republican primaries where like they'll compare the exit polls. Like you won't see substantially higher turnout. You won't see like, oh, there's like 50 percent more people voting in Republican primaries, which might infer that there's like a different sure. proportion of the base. What you'll see is relatively similar primary turnout, but you'll see, oh, um, the Republican Party has become less religious, but more extreme conservative, like more more Republican primary voters are identifying as very conservative or ultra conservative. And um, for them, that translates into I really, really love and support Donald Trump. I mean, me personally, you know, I, I remember uh, I, I remember talking to a friend once and he says um, he says, I'll never forgive Trump for brainwashing my grandma. Yeah. And that's what he said to me. And 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 I've had that experience with family members. I've I've talked to many people who've had that experience where it was like, man, like, you know, my mom growing up wasn't anti-vax. Like she didn't she didn't believe in all this QAnon crazy shit. But like, man, when Trump got elected, it just it, it just triggered something. And like they, they're just different people now. Right. And it's mm -hmm. not to say that Republican primary voters are alien or that they don't have some like material reason for feeling that way. I think that they do. Um, my opinion is just that they're voting for the wrong person to achieve their ultimate goals, right? Like Trump is not the person who's going to lead to a more equal egalitarian society. Trump's not the person who's going to lead to a, a better regulatory state that gets you higher wages, right? Trump's not the person who's going to bring back domestic manufacturing, right? Like it just none of his policies really lead to those like material circumstances that you're, you know, concerned about that lead you to go down this path, um, unfortunately speaking. But I'll well, never forget that. I never, I'll never forget him saying... I'll never forgive Trump for brainwashing my grandma. Cause it's, yeah, I it's think, I, I think a lot of us can like feel that pinch too, where their family members. Um, I, I mean, I I've talked about it in my videos and stuff too, that I've got family members who I love deeply. Um, obviously there, I despise their political views. There's no question about it, but, um, who I feel are part of a cult. And, um, you know, so, so for me, that's, that drives so much of my animus towards Trump and towards Republican leaders, right? So, you know, I grew up in rural Kentucky. I don't hate the Republican voter because very often, even before Trump, I view the Republican voter as also being partial victims. I think one of the great deceptions that the Republican Party, even prior to Trump, pulled off is making poor rural voters in red states effectively cannon fodder for 
a an economic policy, a fiscal policy, which harmed them or at least didn't help them. It's it's like the, the great con of all time. And then Trump took that mentality and then dispersed it with, you know, conspiracy theories with respect to Q and stolen elections and things like that. And people have just been eating it up. And it's heartbreaking. It's frustrating. I'm not saying there's no anger there, but that that drives so much of my contempt for conservative thought leaders and elected Republicans, because these are people who should know better, who traffic in politics professionally and should be in a position to provide some sort of moral pushback. I mean, the iconic example <laughs> is during the Nixon administration, when you had Republicans go to pres President Nixon and say, if you don't resign, you will not only be impeached, you will be convicted in the Senate because Republicans will also vote to convict you. Get the fuck out. There is no presence of that in the Republican Party today with respect to Trump. McConnell's a great example. Going back to Pisco's point, I do consider, I'm sure McConnell considers Trump to be an enemy in certain respects, or at least a frenemy. He obviously, the reporting was contemporaneous that McConnell despised Trump. McConnell thought he was an idiot. Um, you know, and obviously we know how Trump feels about McConnell because Trump airs his issues with McConnell publicly. McConnell always did it behind the scenes, but at the end of the day, McConnell puts party above country. Um, and and right as long as Donald Trump is the leader of the Republican Party, he will always put uh, Trump ahead of the rest of the country. He it, McConnell was one of the ones who killed that bipartisan Senate border bill, even though he was encouraging it previously. He was quoted as saying the politics have changed. Um, so my question is because I have two other topics I want us to address real quick. The economy itself. So convoy, here's my my question. Um Explain this dissonance to me. Right now, Republicans have enjoyed – Republicans for decades have enjoyed a perception advantage on the economy. In my opinion, not just because of propaganda but also because this association between fiscal responsibility and conservatism. Like for me, I remember growing up hearing the phrase, I'm socially liberal but fiscally conservative, and that was considered like the most – you know. Uh, profound statement. There's just like this default uh, association between economic prosperity and sensible economics and conservatism. So I think these mm -hmm. things help like, like bake in the GOP advantage. Why is it, in your opinion, that these macroeconomic indicators, which we've always used to evaluate economies, right? We haven't changed the metrics by which we evaluate the strength of the national economy. Why they're all saying the Biden economy is fan-fucking-tastic. Why has it been so slow for Americans to recognize that? And then number two, why is there still no polling evidence that they're associating that with Biden? But you know if that it was happening under Trump, they'd be giving Trump all the credit in the world for it. What do you mm -hmm. think? Uh, I think 538, 538 did a, they have a podcast um, with uh, hosted by Galen Daruk. Uh, and it, I think it's a pretty good podcast for um, kind of like regularly checking the temperature of the political landscape. And they had a podcast on this specific topic where they had uh, a couple of economists who are sort of in charge of measuring uh, consumer sentiment was one of them. And then the other one studied sort of partisanship and how it affects sort of your um, your views on the economy. And what they said was that um, con uh, consumer sentiment's ticking up. And what you tend to see is that especially in periods of higher elevated inflation, that consumer sentiment is just sticky with prices. So um, and if you look at a graph of consumer sentiment and overlay inflation, what you see is that there's about a six month delay. So as 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 disinflation started to happen, um, you know, consumer sentiment was still uh, going down because people were still pissed off, even though there was disinflation happening. But at a certain point, expectations settle and um, they they start to notice prices being a bit more stable than they used to. And then consumer sentiment ticks up. And what you see um, based on uh, just going to Fred and going to the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey, what you see is that consumer sentiment is actually about as high as it was as when Biden took office. Um, and it's about as high as it was actually when Obama won re-election. So it's not really clear to me that even people are necessarily going to go into this election, assuming we stay the course, that's a big assumption, but assuming we stay the course that people are going to go into this election with like a, an incredible hatred of the economy and like attacking that, uh, attaching that to Joe Biden. I think that the economy becomes more of an asset to Joe Biden as we go further and further and further into disinflation, into maybe the Fed cutting rates, um, into just generally consumer sentiment getting better. And then, you know, in in terms of Republicans specifically, like one thing that uh, one of the economists said on this podcast was that um, it seems to be the case that when you look at sentiment bipartisanship, 
um, like bipartisanship, not bipartisanship. Uh, when you look at it by, you know, how partisan the person is, that consistently Republicans tend to cheer louder and boo harder, right? That um, typically speaking, when a Republican's in office, Republican voters and Republican politicians and like Republican sort of, you know, general members of the party will be like super duper crazy. Like, oh my God, the economy is great. All of a sudden, because a Republican's in office, it's amazing. And then when a Democrat's in office, they'll do the exact opposite. The economy's dog shit. It's horrible. Everything's going terrible. Um, whereas Democrats will be a little bit more muted. The effect still exists with Democrats where Democrats perceive the economy to be better when a Democrat's in office, worse when a Republican's in office. But the skew is not quite as extreme with Democrats, which again, I think just goes back to this general sort of trend of like Republicans are gener like genuinely speaking, significantly more partisan than the average you know Democratic voter. And I mean, there's a lot of sort of heuristics for that. Like, obviously, look at who we elect, right? We go from, you know, Clinton to Obama to, tr to not to Trump, <laughs> from Clinton to Obama to Biden. Um, whereas, you know, the, the Republicans go from Dole, who's, I mean, about as centrist a, you know, conservative as you can imagine, to uh, Bush, who, you know, a little bit, a little bit more conservative leaning, let's say. Um, and then to Trump, who, you know, substantially more conservative, uh, which, you uh, you know, I, I think you it's, skipped it's fair to two say well. very more moderate conservatives, Econo Boy. I take issue with your analysis there. Maybe Trump is the one that's different in in all the. Um. Uh, well, I mean, here. yeah, like McCain. I mean, McCain was the nominee, uh, certainly as well, um, in there. But I don't know. I, I think that that generally might go against the, the the broad trend, especially when you look at the legislative elections, where the composition of the sort of House of Representatives of Republicans, right? We have this sort of you know, this like small kind of like small government libertarian Ron Paul type movement in the early 2000s, but that's never really gotten very big. But then the neocons took over from the moderates in the 90s. And then the uh, the Tea Partiers took over in 2010. And then the MAGA conservatives took over in basically 2016 onwards. And so I think that all that combined uh, just kind of goes towards this general narrative that part of the reason why a lot of the sentiment of the economy is like sticky um, it is partisan in nature that like Republicans are ultimately going to perceive the economy to be substantially worse when a Democrat's in office or like structurally worse when a Democrat's in office, well, even if um, the economy is actually decent. Well, since you Pisco, to... hey, I'm, I know Pisco is going to respond, but I also have there are two questions or two comments from the audience that I want you to address Econoboy when Pisco is done. Sure thing. And uh, so Econoboy, okay. since you charted the start of this or I don't know the start, but at least some of the, the, the nexus of the, the sentiment located in partisanship. And you mentioned the Tea Party, or I think you were referencing the Tea Party uh, going into the MAGA movement. I'm curious, uh, I'm going to come to you as a dissatisfied partisan Tea Party-ish MAGA type person and ask you why these solutions aren't, uh, would be good to implement. So for example, if I were to say, say we need to get rid of the Fed or we want actually deflation, um, how would you respond to people who say that these are the kind of policy initiatives we need to take uh, to get prices back back to normal? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, if, if somebody's prior is basically just that prices go down is good, it's very difficult to argue them out of that um, intuitively because it is a very intuitive position. I think that um, it's kind of like when somebody asks, uh, why would we want Medicare for all when um, that costs the government more money? It's like, well, but it costs the economy less money, right? And so we, we have to think of like in costs to consumers. And similarly, when we're thinking about inflation, well, you know, prices being stable is a good thing. Um, inflation, like hi, moderately high inflation, like above zero, let's say, is good as a signal to the economy because it means that there's like generally a demand for money, right? Like that there, there's a demand for investment, money circulating. Um, there, pe you know, people are fighting for dollars and that's a good thing. And that's why whenever you see, you know, recessions, we typically have deflation because money's not circulating, right? And so that's why it's good to have low moderate inflation versus deflation. And at the end of the day, if your wages are rising above prices, well, guess what? Your life is better off, right? And so that's where, you know, you can you can funnel that back into the conversation that, hey, it's really about wages. It's really about our economic institutions. It's really about the distribution of income. And it's not necessarily about, you know, you know, grapes go up by 1% a year in price or something like that. That's right? a lot of words, a hard sell. I don't know how to make that sell. Uh, that's the one thing I've been having trouble with is, is to people who are like, well, why won't, why won't eggs be this much now? And I don't know if I, what is the good one sentence answer to that? 
Well, well, I think that the good well, ones. Hang on, before, are... before, sorry, just maybe you can sorry. tie this in. So, Econoboy, one of the questions was yeah. from Conscious Robot: I'm economically illiterate, but greedflation is kind of a problem, right? Aren't corporations raking in record profits? Yeah, I was going to say that um, the good one sentence answer that you can give to people is that the, the biggest problem in the economy is not you know, 3% inflation versus 2% inflation like we normally have, right? Because people, again, when, when inflation is low and stable, nobody talks about inflation. Inflation was not a thing anybody gave a fuck about for like the last 20 years because, you know, inflation generally was low and stable, right? Um, and so I think that really, if I'm talking to that person, they're saying, you know, oh, the biggest problem is the fact that eggs <laughs> go up by 10%. It's like, no, that's not the biggest problem. Like the biggest problem in this economy currently is the fact that we're so unequal as a society, right? You know, the reason that the problem that you should look for is not, oh, the Fed raising interest rates, oh, these immigrants are coming in. You know, you should look at the fact that we have a tax system that taxes you at a higher percentage than billionaires. That's the biggest problem in our economy, right? Both for your own circumstance and for economy wide circumstance. And I think that when it comes to the democratic message, I think that that's one of the few democratic messages that's actually pulled relatively well and actually been able to capture some of the ethos is this idea that, well, uh, the reason we're seeing so much inflation is because of elevated corporate profits, right? That people actually have made that part of their general lexicon, like, oh, it's greedflation, right? It's it's not necessarily the fault of Biden or these policies. It's because these filthy corporations are basically extracting money out of the economy, out of people's pockets, right? So, okay, so there's one other question uh, specifically for McCon or for Econoboy. This one right here: Fire rises. Biden is just rising, riding the post-COVID economic wave. All his stats are skewed because of it. What do you say? Um, I mean, you know, I'm are. not sure. I mean, well, not really. Like, I think, um, like, I'm not really. Well, come sure on, wow, the jobs created like, number that's that is misleading. Well, no, 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 because he's saying he's saying he's currently riding the wave, right? And I, I think the okay. issue I have with that is that, I mean, look, you know, COVID, COVID began in March of 2020, right? In terms of this country, um, that yes. was four years ago, right? The 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 lockdowns ended, I believe, lockdowns functionally ended essentially about six months into Biden's term. You know, Biden's been president over three years now. Right. So, I mean, unless the argument is, well, hey, the fact that lockdowns ended two and a half years ago, but we're still riding a wave of like opening up the economy. I mean, I, I really am that's not what Democrats say that about argument. Trump's economic progress. They say they're riding off of Obama's economic wave from the recovery into well, uh, from the Great Recession. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a difference between saying that like it's a matter of drawing the bright line, basically. Right. Like I think that for a lot of Republicans, they'll say. Well, the economy was good under Trump. And the question that I always have for them is like, OK, what are the policies that Trump did that made the economy better? And mm -hmm. what a lot of them will say is, well, he cut taxes. And it's like, OK, well, 90 percent of those benefits went to the top one percent and they saved that money. That money actually didn't circulate in the economy. It didn't lead to higher levels of investment. Like what? did? OK, so besides that, what did he do? Oh, well, he cut regulations. OK, well, what regulations did he cut? Just tell me, like, what are the regulations that he made substantially more efficient that made the economy save a lot of money, made it more efficient. The answer is always, well, I mean, he, uh, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, he cut regulation somewhat. And I mean, that's probably good, right? And so the issue is that I think that um, it's almost like arguing with a, a Christian who's never read the Bible, right? It's like you, you, you just kind of culturally are attached to this notion of, of Christianity and what you think the Bible says. Um, and similarly, when you talk to one of these conservatives who's really attached to the Trump economy, you can't really draw a bright line. But with Biden... I can I can draw very clear bright lines as to what did Biden do that improved the economy substantially or made a better economic circumstance for the average person. That's a little bit easier for me than a Trump supporter, because Trump, frankly, didn't really pass that many you know, bills Correct. that substantially affect the economy. Right. So so I'm not I'm not anywhere near as economically literate as a conboy is. I consider myself more conversant than the average person. The case I've been trying to make in my videos is this number one. And I'm sure a conboy would cop to this. It is it is reductive as hell, Democrat or Republican, to associate the strength of an economy, um, certainly as, 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 on, on a national scale, singularly with the president of the United States. You know, the thing I always say when I discuss President Biden's economy is I say, you know, individually, the, the president of the United States is the most powerful and influential person in the world. And certainly things that the president can do, not just in terms of uh, executive action and legislation, but also the shit that he says. Um, certainly can have an impact on markets and the economy. So I don't want to say that the president has nothing to do with it. Um, but my beef is the reason that I, I I am that guy who says when they talk about the strength of the, the Trump economy pre-COVID, which, by the way, why would we ever grant that? 
Donald Trump was president for four fucking years. I will die on the hill of I'm not giving you a mulligan for 2020 unless you want to sign in blood that you would do the same for a Democrat, which they'll never do. And I, I refuse. I will never play by the double standard. He gets fucking credit and the blame for all four years, not just three. Number one. Number two, if you look at a lot of those macroeconomic metrics, they were continuations of Obama era trends, except I think it spiked up uh, in terms of like average stock market performance under Donald Trump. Right. But again, to what extent that is in terms of where you would rank order that in terms of macroeconomic metrics, I feel like GDP growth and unemployment are more important. I digress. Then, as Econoboy says, okay, well, are you, can you actually attribute shit that Trump did to the strength of the economy? Or is it just like post hoc ergo propter hoc? This thing happened after Trump was in office or during Trump's presidency, ergo, he gets credit for it. Then with Biden, you can actually point to the American Rescue Plan, you know, avoiding a, a double digit recession, creating four million jobs ahead of schedule because it, it invigorated the economy. You can also point to the if you want to. This is my beef with people who say, well, the 15 million jobs that's post pandemic recovery. Well, let's say I grant the premise. Probably not inclined to because I can point out to Biden's vaccination rollout plan, which allowed the economy to open back up. Right. So Biden gets credit for that. But let's say I grant you that. Biden, I think we hit pre-pandemic recovery in terms of like the, the job numbers in like 2023. And if you look, if you compare Biden's economy during Trump's economy for a similar period of time and you account for COVID, there have been more jobs created monthly created under Biden than Trump. So no matter how you fucking slice it, Biden is just better than Trump. And we can actually point right. to material things like I, I the think, Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction yeah. Act and, and all the things. I think there's something to be said, and, and Josiah, you and I have talked about this before on various shows, is that Republicans, again, that, that cheering louder is not just a thing that Republicans voter do. It's a thing that Republican politicians do as well, right? Where it seems like a lot of Democrats are frankly very tepid, right? When it comes to defending the record of Democratic presidencies, right? Um, in part, that's because we do have like the Democratic Socialists, uh, Democrats who, uh, to be fair, like I have my own criticisms for the Obama economy. If you're, you know, for instance, the economy was going to recover at some point after the financial recession, even if nothing was done by any government official. Um, but it's a matter of how quick was that recovery? Like if Obama had passed twice the stimulus, well, we probably would have recovered about twice as fast. Right. But he passed a very small stimulus package. So we had a very slow, methodical recovery, um, which continued uh, basically until COVID. Right. And so, you know, I, I think that there's some legitimate criticism of the Democratic record. But I again, like I wish Biden and hopefully he'll he'll do this going forward. Um, was just a little bit more forceful about that. You know, the Republicans taking credit for infrastructure investment that they voted against, right? The, you know, the Republicans who were saying, we need to manufacture chips in this country and chips are such a problem and chips, 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 but they vote against the Chips Act, right? And it's like- Another guys, great like, moment of the of the State of the Union, by the way, was when he pointed that out, that they were taking credit for, uh, what's that? Are you sponsored by- No, somebody somebody Boston? asked, he's like, is my man drinking WD-40? It kind of looks like baby. that can, yeah. just yeah. to be real. <laughs> But no, I, I, I think yeah. that um, to be fair, and, and that's that's one of the reasons why I think that Obama, no, I'm sorry, not Obama. I, I think that's one of the reasons why I think that Biden, generally speaking, or I, I keep saying generally, genuinely speaking, has been a better president than Obama is that especially going into reelection, he has a much more substantial record to actually run on than Obama had. Um, and you can actually point to specific huge economic accomplishments Um like for instance, you know, we're hitting we're hitting record renewable energy investments. Um, I think that there was there was some crazy statistic, which was like I think that the Obama administration, not the Obama administration, the Biden administration had added something like like hundreds of thousands of jobs just in like the renewable energy sector alone. Um, and of course, that can't all be because of the IRA, but it's a substantial portion of it is. And you know, I know that from a from a personal basis. And so, um, just that alone is you got you know, the, the money, you got the check, and now you're. No, doing what, I, what I'm saying is like that's something that resonates with a lot of people. There's even a lot of conservatives who think that climate change is a problem. And so, like, hey, the largest investment in you know energy and sustainability in the country's history that's a great record to run on, right? You know, it's, you know, investing in manufacturing through the Chips Act. You know, the biggest. Bipartisan infrastructure deal in the country's history, you know, the, 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 what do you call it? The, uh, the American rescue plan, right? These are all things that are very substantial that he can run on. Whereas Trump, unfortunately, he's in the same position as the average Republican who thinks that the economy was good under Trump. Oh, well, look, well, look at this. Unemployment was low, black unemployment, lowest in history under me. But if you actually have a conversation with Trump and you actually have that debate with Trump, like, well, 
what did you actually do that led to the average person being better off under your administration? Well, we cut taxes. Well, hey, most of that went to the top 1%. Well, yes, but I mean, uh, well, but you're grooming Biden. He's demented. You know, like there's not really that a debate up kind of like between you and Trump. <laughs> No, but I'm saying like there's not really a substantive response that you can give. Um, and uh, although the average voter is not like an economist, obviously, um, I, I think that um, the big things that are motivating even the MAGA base are the things that I talked about. Right. Um, when inequality is really, really high, people tend to vote for more radical politics. Right. And I don't think that's uh, an exception with the MAGA base. You know, right wing and left wing populism both take advantage of high levels of inequality when it rises. Um, but I think Biden's done a much better job of actually addressing that uh, than than Trump. So, so in, in conclusion, it's a vibe session, and you're and you're you're one of the vibe session people. Um, no, I wouldn't say it's a vibe session. You're like I think the voters that you and Will Stansel, come on, baby, admit it, <laughs> admit it. No, 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 I would I wouldn't say it's a vibe session because like yeah. people, I think people have legitimate reason to be angry when like inflation is higher than it normally is, right? Like when we mm -hmm. have substantially higher price increases than we're used to. It's just understandable that people are going to notice that people are going to be like, hey, I don't like this. Um, and it's also understandable, especially again, like especially for lower income people like, um, y you know, like me personally, like I would consider myself, uh, I would say like upper middle income, like just based on the job that I do. Like I don't I don't like when prices when the price of eggs goes from two dollars a dozen to two fifty. I just simply don't notice that as much as somebody who's you're really counting every dollar. <laughs> Cause, Very cause true, yeah. Well, I, I do want to say there's an interesting point that, that Conable is making. I mean, he's, I generally agree with a lot of what he's saying, um, but his solution in terms of the rhetoric is interesting to me because it sounds like what his solution is, is to focus, is to kind of shift the dialogue a little bit and say, I don't really think that's the problem. I think the problem is this. And the shifting is occurring to be more populist. In other words, he is arguing that I think I'm hearing this as a rhetorical strategy, even though you have this long analysis about why Biden's not responsible for it. At the end of the day, what you think is most rhetorically effective is to shift the dialogue and focus on inequality, which is a Bernie populist talking point. Um, and I just find that interesting. I just, I, I, I also get the sense that that's is. true. I agree with yeah. you, Connor. I, I get the sense that that's true. But it also gives you a sense of where the country is at the moment, that they're in a populist mode. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that I don't think it's a coincidence that Biden himself has spoken more populistically, let's say, and um, in a more populist manner um, in general and, and like engaged in more sort of populist policy um, through industrial policy. Like it seems like we have both both parties that believe in sort of like some level of protectionism, some level of like industrial policy. But. I think that that's the that's the message that I would try to sell to voters is, you know, how do you want this anger to be channeled? Do you want it to be channeled through tax cuts to the rich? Well, if you want that, then vote for the Republicans. But if you want it to be channeled through smart, empirically validated, effective industrial policy, which so many other countries have engaged in, you vote for the Democrats. And and again, we have records to compare. Trump did his industrial policy where, you know, he did tariffs and made everything more expensive for people. And he did. I mean. You know, imagine Trump, who is president now, doing a bunch of tariffs. I mean, that would only make inflation worse, but did a bunch of tariffs, made all of our allies pissed off. I mean, domestic manufacturing wasn't exactly great under his administration um, and uh, tax cuts for the rich, whereas Biden is doing substantially less of the bad things and substantially more of the good things. Right. Uh, and so that's why I think uh, Biden's going to have the, the edge over uh, over over Trump. I mean, one of the things in the IRA that he did, for instance, which I think he can speak directly to forgotten sort of. Uh, you know, coal communities is that he added specific subsidies and, you know, whatever policy wonks and neoliberals can get mad about this. But like, again, it's, you know, we, we don't, we don't live in a time where neoliberal economics is popular. Right. So, you know, cope, I guess a little bit more, but the point is, is that Biden added specific subsidies to the IRA that said, Hey, if you build a renewable energy plant in an energy community, which was like natural gas or coal, you will get extra incentive to invest in those projects. Like one thing I hear about the Trump economy all the time is, like and it's it's so funny when fucking conservatives say this and they just don't know shit about what Trump actually did. They'll talk about um they'll talk about uh what was it called uh, opportunity zones. Oh, Trump did opportunity mm -hmm. zones. That's a great thing. Isn't that great for black communities and poor communities? Because basically, if you invest in these communities, you get a tax cut. And it's like well yeah yeah that's that's fine. But tr but Biden actually did that times like a thousand with hundreds of billions of dollars of investment disproportionately directly in coal and natural gas communities. 
right? And that's what you're starting to see in places like West Virginia, where like the average high school kid in West Virginia isn't learning to be a fucking coal miner or he gives a shit about that. You've got a lot of trade schools that are funneling them into learning how to install solar panels and learning how to work as wind turbine technicians, right? And those are the jobs of the future. And that's what Biden invested in. And I, I just think that that's a substantially uh, more effective record to run on than Trump. Biden just has to make it known. And I think that Democrats historically have, have done a poor job making it known that, hey, if you want jobs to be created, if you want equality, if you want uh, the rich to pay their fair share, you vote for Democrats. You don't vote for Republicans. Yeah. So before we change the subject to the last thing, and this is where Pisco might get heated uh, when we turn into the last topic and me, I might get heated, too, depending on what Pisco's position is. I'm curious what the rest of you think. But I will say there is polling data to strongly suggest that. um it, so it's complicated. So I, I hear a lot of people, not just like people are on the quote unquote far left, but like uh, I listen to a lot of Pod Save America. They are their former Obama uh, and 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 Clinton uh, staffers. They were speech writers. They were pollsters and policy wonks. They surprised me too because their position has been for the longest time that the president and Democrats should be should not spend too much time trying to tout the president's record because it comes off lecturing. And I understand that in theory, but I just kind of reject it ultimately in the end because I feel like this idea that, you know, it, commentators and the media should simply reflect what people believe and don't shape what people believe. I just don't think it's true. I think it's a feedback loop. I mean, part of the reason why Republicans enjoy such a colossal advantage in terms of perception on the economy is because for years and years and years and years and years, they've been relentlessly told to associate a strong economy with the Republican uh, with a Republican presidency. So I do feel like there has to be some degree of re-education and propaganda associated with the president's wins that you shouldn't just completely distance yourself from it. Obviously, you got to be careful about how you do it. Um, but there's also polling data which suggests this works, especially among the so-called double haters. So people who are not fans of President Biden or Donald Trump, if you look, the vast majority of them are completely unaware about the Chips and Science Act and the Inf Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure law. And then if you make them aware of it, um, they flip to being just a Trump hater. Like there's poll after poll after poll shows that you can win double haters who are dissatisfied with both Trump and Biden by educating them about Biden's policy accomplishments. And it also goes to the border. Uh, Chris Murphy, who's a Democratic senator, he actually released uh, – he, he was talking about this a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it was fascinating. There's credible polling which indicates that even though Republicans enjoy a 15-point advantage on the border if people are told that the immigration – bill was scuttled because of cynical Republican politics. It doesn't go 15 points in the opposite direction. It doesn't give Democrats 15 point advantage, but it eliminates it. They're, they're, they're then neck and neck, right? So it makes it a much more competitive landscape. So I agree. I feel like, I feel like we've got to just start bragging. There was a, there was a, um, a video that went viral of a rapper, um, who, was complaining to the president, the vice president. He's like, y'all got to learn how to fucking brag because Trump did it all the time about shit that he had no business bragging about and would very often lie about. And you just got to try doing that. And, and so I, I do think that that has to be part of the calculus. So here's where the topic changes. I want to talk about the Supreme Court for a minute, okay? And this is, Peace goes a fucking lawyer here, all right? And he and I have some agreements <laughs> with this. We have some disagreements. Peace go, my man. I'm getting fed up with this fucking court, bro. I'm getting fed up with it. And also on a structural level, just the more I keep thinking about this and you compare it with every other advanced democracy on earth. And I definitely want to hear what Stacks and the Con Boy have to say about this too. We have a fucked up Supreme Court. Like the, <laughs> from just a structural basis, no term limits, no, the fucking rigid composition, a simple majority vote for judicial like our the Supreme Court's judicial review powers in this country is OP compared to any other country on earth. You could easily make the case easily that as long as the Congress and as long as the Supreme Court pay the appropriate deference to the Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court is by far the most powerful branch of government. So we've got it. We got to rein this court in, baby. I'm not saying it's illegitimate. I'm just saying Nine unelected lifetime appointees being more powerful than the president and, this, and the Congress, that doesn't work with me, especially when it's completely out of touch with what the majority of people want. So the context for this is the recent 14th Amendment decision, which was a 9-0 top line decision that Colorado and states can't take the president or presidential candidates off ballots. And then you have the upcoming immunity case, which has not been decided yet. 
But look what they did with respect to the scheduling. They didn't have to take the case in the first place. They put it at the very oral arguments the very last day in fucking April. Defend this goddamn court. Yeah, Where, sure. Yeah. I'm going to start by explaining why this ruling is terrible substantively. And without reference to the outcome, you know, I think this is ruling would be terrible if, if they were trying to get Joe Biden off the ballot, to be to be frank with you. And so I'm going to start by um, attacking the ruling and saying it's ridiculous. Both the concurrence, bo both concurrences and the per curiam decision. I think they're both ridiculous. And I understand, by the way, that it was a 9-0 decision on an important matter that disagrees with me. That's OK. I predicted the court was going to come this way, but I disagree vehemently and i'm going to explain why i think substantively they got it wrong and then the next part of my answer i'm going to defend why i think even though i think there should be some reforms i don't go as far as pondering politics josiah goes uh, in his attacks on uh our independent judiciary uh so quote unquote i'm sure he'll say uh, independent um so first of all why why did the court get this wrong in my opinion well it doesn't have to do with in, in my opinion um with like the outcome per se of Trump being on the ballot or not being on the ballot. It's it's how you get there. It's the reasoning that the court gives for that. Um, and, and I think even as a structural matter, I'm not so sure that Josiah or me think it's like, in terms of the political discourse, the best outcome that Trump be disqualified from any, any ballot. I think ultimately you can't rely on the courts to solve a political problem, which is Trumpism, the rise of Trump, MAGA authoritarianism in this country. Uh, the court's not gonna save us from that. So like in terms of the outcome, I'm not, I'm agnostic about which outcome I want vis-a-vis -vis, like the actual result. But in terms of the reasoning and why Section 3, they said, could not be enforced by the Colorado courts, it was horrendous reasoning. Why? This is what they said about the, the provision of Section 3, which says that you cannot uh, be in office if you were uh, engaged in insurrection before and having been a previous oath taker. They said because the 14th Amendment was designed to be aggrandizing the power of the federal government generally and lowering the power of the state governments generally, it would be perverse to read it as giving um, authorities to states to um, go above and beyond what they were allowed to do pre-Section 3. Now, on first blush, that seems to make sense, right? It is true that the 14th Amendment was a reshuffling of power in many ways of the federal versus state government. The Fourth Amendment, as you, as many of you may know, gave uh, required states to provide due process of law, provided equal protection of the law, um, and you know gave you know birthright citizenship. And so there are a lot of provisions there that are restricting the states. And so at first blush, you might say, hey, that makes sense. Why should states be allowed to put uh, impositions on federal candidates for office? But you have to remember that, and again, they said without authorization from Congress. You have to remember that the court in coming to that conclusion said that states are allowed under section three of the 14th amendment to go after state officials. And the rationale they gave for that is, well, states already had this assumed sovereignty to fix their um, elections and their governmental structures, however they wanted to. And so we're not going to read section three as some kind of abridging of the pre-existing rights that states had to shape their elect, uh, you know, elections, right. And, and to shape their, their qualifications for state officers. And so their argument was, well, states are states are allowed to enforce Section 3 without congressional authorization. That is, it is self-executing as to state officers because states have this pre-existing authority to shape their governments. However, they didn't have this pre-existing authority with federal officers because their federal officers are subject or you know a creature of the constitution. And so we can't assume that as part of the sovereign background. What's the problem with this? The states are specifically delegated the authority to elect electors for president under the Constitution in Article 2. That is to say, just like states have pre-existing authorities to structure their government however they want, they are specifically delegated the authority to assign their electors however they want. And um, you might think that's weird. I don't agree with the system. I'm against the Electoral College. I think it should be a unitary, popular vote for president. But the truth is, in this country, there isn't a unified election for president. It is 51, 50 states plus D.C., independent elections that don't even have to happen. You don't even need to have an, a popular election for electors for president in a state. In fact, there are many states in which... To you, clarify, when you say need, you mean the Constitution does, does not, not require them. Right. Yeah. So the, the states before um, assigned their electors directly through legislation. 
without any vote. And there are myriad, myriad uh, limitations that states impose to be on the ballot. Think about it. Like you need to have 40,000 signatures to be on the ballot. That seems like the state is imposing a state rule, a state limitation on qualification for ballot access for a federal candidate. Exactly what they said was illegitimate, illegitimate under the 14th Amendment. Well, that makes no sense. Then how can states put additional limitations and restrictions on federal candidates for officers in this kind of loosey-goosey, uh, uh, ad, ad hoc way? Uh, additionally, no one seems to deny that states are allowed to enforce other federal qualifications for office. That is the age, age of a candidate, the national citizenship. Think about Chank Yuga running for office. They don't even try to distinguish state's ability to enforce that as to uh, federal candidates um, in, in one sense. But they, and, and Neil Gorsuch himself was in a case called Hassan in the, um, I think, the 11th Circuit or, or the 10th Circuit, I forget, um, whatever circuit Colorado's in. He ruled that states are allowed to enforce the age, or sorry, the natural uh, citizenship qualification as against federal candidates for state office, or sorry, for state elections for those candidates. And didn't the Colorado Supreme Court, when they made their 14th Amendment decision, preemptively cited. cite uh, yes. Judge Gorsuch? Yeah. And so there is not even an attempt by the majority in this per curiam decision to, one, deal seriously with the presidential electors clause, which assigns states the authority to assign their electors. It's a pre-existing authority that is an assumed part of a structure, just like the state's right to organize their, their governments. And they don't even deal with, well, then how can states enforce other federal qualifications for federal offices in state elections? And so it's an absolutely shambolic opinion. And guess what? Nine justices voted against what I just articulated. But there is no response. There is absolutely no response to it. It's a complete misreading of a basic constitutional civics procedure. It is a ruling, an outcome in search of an argument. And you can see now, like even... I understand it's a 9-0 decision. So you're like, what is it? You think he knows better than this? Look at the legal commentary about the responses to this. How many people are in favor of it? How many people will actually defend the opinion on the merits? I, you know, I look forward to all the lawyers coming on streams to defend it with and, and argue it against me. So, um, and, and then the other part of it, the advisory opinion, where the court, the per curiam court, went beyond what they needed to. A basic sort of everyone's thought tenant of, of federal jurisprudence is you're not supposed to decide cases that are not before you. And they decided much more than they needed to in order to avoid Chief Justice Roberts and others' potential problems later on when people try to enforce federal qualifications in federal courts because they don't want to have to hear that. It's a little bit um, you know, dissatisfying for them or a little bit scary or spooky to envision other, um, other potential challenges that aren't based on congressional legislation. And what do you have then? The result is they've read out section three of the constitution effectively because they know Congress isn't going to enforce it. And, and there's no, uh, it's dead um, letter, isn't it? it? It's a dead letter unless people decide to get charged for the first time in history with the insurrection statute. That's the one statute that they said could enforce it. Although keep in mind that statute was passed before uh, section three of the fourth amendment in 1862 and recall that the uh, fourth amendment was passed later in the 1860s. And so it's weird to think that that statute is enforcing section three. And so this opinion is sloppy. It's messy. It uh, doesn't address the argument to the other side. It is a horrible opinion. Um, the concurrence does a good job about the advisory opinion, but they are also horrible in the fundamental misplacement of civics here. Horrific decision, in my opinion. And I'm happy to debate that. It's still my opinion. It was my opinion weeks ago. I would have rather they come to the opinion that Trump did not engage in insurrection than to come to this opinion. Yeah, All so before said, you defend SCOTUS, yeah. before you defend SCOTUS, a couple of things you pointed out. So uh, Congressman Raskin, Democrat um, from Maryland, I believe, it, it's not going to it's not going to go anywhere, but it's a good political stunt if Democrats play it right, is they he's like, listen, I take the Supreme Court's a decision at face value. Fine. Fair enough. It's up to Congress. And so he is actually trying to resurrect legislation, which it's uh, it's basically enacting, executing legislation for the 14th Amendment. Now, where this isn't going to go anywhere, Republicans have absolutely no interest in taking that up. Imagine right? that. <laughs> but. If if Raskin, who is very shrewd, very smart, I love that guy. And if Democrats are firing on all cylinders, they can use this as a potential wedge issue since polling with respect to January 6th and, and Trump's big lie in general is still really bad for him uh, in terms of the general public. So this could be a good wedge issue where Raskin say, can say, hmm, it's kind of curious that these Republicans aren't interested in codifying section three. Right. Right. And, and obviously a much more rhetorically effective way than what we're going to do here. So with that in mind now. Yeah, with Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you were, yeah. you were saying so with all that said. I think it's a shambolic opinion. It's horrible. 
it, it's in line with a lot of other decisions. They're, they're dodging it in the worst possible way and creating a bad precedent in, in the process of doing it. Why do I think the Supreme Court is still worth fighting for? Not to say that I'm against any and all changes to it. I agree that the Supreme Court number of justices should be increased. There's just too much workload these days. Um, I agree that uh, it's been static for too long. I, I think that what McConnell did with Garland's uh, nomination was horrific and it deserves a um, – it's as though there were a nuclear option uh, pulled by Republicans to increase the number of seats in their term. So I don't see a difference between doing that and what – um, Senator McConnell did um, at the time. So I agree there should be some changes there. But an independent judiciary, in quotes, whatever you want to say, insulated from the political branches is a very good idea. It's a very good idea that, in my opinion, on in general, promotes stability in democracies. And I understand that right now, recent decisions we don't agree with, Dobbs, this opinion, the Biden student loan case, which I think was also ridiculous by the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, just crazy, crazy opinion by the court. Yeah. But in general, over the long term, I respect the Supreme Court as an institution. And I'm not willing, because of my vehement disagreement on one, two, three, or seven cases in the last year, to say, hey, this court, we need to take away all their jurisdiction or we need to shut it down or we need to we need to have an amendment which will never pass anyway to yeah. term limit them, that kind of thing. It's not worth our energy politically. Okay. So so again, I want Econoboy and Stacks to jump in on this, but I, so whenever you guys feel ready. But here here's my question. I let's let's be clear about a couple of things. Number one, constitutional amendments require two chambers or super majorities in both chambers and then three quarters of the states to ratify. We're not getting an amendment anytime soon. It could be decades before we see one again. To put this in perspective, this is a sobering statistic, which also goes to show how as amazing in theory as our we have we have the oldest contiguous written documented constitution the oldest contiguous democratic republic i'm not here to shit on every institution here in the united states we 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 were a trendsetter for a reason but i would argue that younger advanced democracies took our our formula and improved on it in various ways it is virtually impossible to make any constitutional head ground here in the united states we've had 12,000 in 250 years 12,000 literally attempts to amend the constitution. We only have 27 amendments. It is the hardest, literally, the hardest constitution in the world by far to amend. So to Pisco's point that it's impractical, you won't get any arguments out of me, okay? But I guess my question is practicality aside, in terms of the substance, this is the thing that I rescue or wrestle with. I'm not an attorney. I got a poli-sci degree, so constitutional structure is fascinating to me. We were we were sold this bill of goods with three co-equal branches, which is a bit of a misnomer. They're not co-equal in terms of raw power because the founders always believed that Congress was supposed to be first among equals. In theory, Congress has the most checks it can impose on the other branches, and in theory, the fewest checks it receives, right? Here's the way I look at it, though, where, where again, I, I struggle with it, Pisco. I want you to help me out. I understand that you want, in theory— a high court which is insulated from politics. Let's assume that that's possible. I, I hear you. Why does it have to be this powerful and this rigid? There's yeah, I, no other advanced I, democracy on earth which has a court where, you know, right now, you know, what is the meaningful check against the United States Supreme Court? There's none. We can't get a constitutional amendment. What can the president do other than just non-acquiescence, which I assume you wouldn't support? No, I wouldn't. The support Supreme that. Court was never intended to be the supreme branch. Never. They're supposed they they may have been supreme in their very narrow land, their nar narrow very narrow lane, excuse me, but otherwise they're supposed to fuck off and let the vast majority of governing be done by the president and the Congress. I want to let Econo Boy and Stacks in, yeah. but I, I just have a quick response to that is think sure. about so, not all the cases, but a lot of the major cases that you're citing where the Supreme Court has got it extremely wrong, in my opinion. Uh, let's start with Dobbs. Dobbs sure. was a right invented by the court, even though I agree with Roe sure. v. Wade. We wouldn't even have that right to discuss with if we didn't have a judicial review of a Texas law. And so um, this is a case where you're disagreeing with the court using uh, uh, overturning a previous use of, of judicial review and so it, it seems incongruous to be mad at the court for even having judicial review or thinking they're, they're being inappropriate about it when the case that you like that they're overturning 
is a, a, a prime example of judicial review. And then the I, second one, I, real quick, mm. uh, this recent case of Section 3, this recent case of Section 3, the court was saying you need legislation and you can't just self-execute and we're and we're giving it to Congress. And so to the extent that the court is imposing anything, it's just saying that you need to go to the political branches, which is what you're professing to say that they want anyway. It would seem, now I disagree with the court. I think the court is putting a limitation on the state abilities to act here, but they're not usurping the role of the, at least in those two examples, uh, of the legislatures in that in that respect, at least not the legislators in, in Congress. They're giving Congress that authority. And the last case, I think where it does go to your point, is the Biden student loan example where they are striking down a policy from the executive. But what they're saying is that Congress didn't legislate it. So you can you can spin that as them upholding the, the rights of the Congress to uh, they do know. all sorts of clever sleights of hand. We'll get I'll get I'll respond to that. But again, Stacks and Econoboy, if you guys want to want to jump in about the, yeah, can I can yeah. I actually just clarify your position, Pisco? Sure. Because when asked about term limits, you mentioned that it wasn't politically feasible, but like do you feel like it's like, is it political feasibility or are you also like morally opposed to term limits? Like if it was political feasible, would you go for I'm it? against I'm against it substantively and politically. Yeah. I think that yeah, it's really good to have them to, to have these people be insulated and giving them term limits well, would I think I mean there's there's to ways to I don't know. I, I disagree with this idea that you have to have a lifetime. I mean, we're Americans, right? We don't believe in lifetime offices except for Supreme Court justices, basically, right? All, all um, federal judges. So, so this includes every federal well, yeah, federal, federal, federal judge behavior, well, right? Let's and just so, be clear about. Let's just be clear. The basis for this is is Article Three or Section Three, or Article Three of the Constitution. Right. So, so um, long as you have good behavior. behavior or whatever. Yeah. 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 I mean, like, I I don't. There, there's there's obviously ways, and there's there's ways that other democracies have found uh, to essentially cycle through justices in a way that politically insulates them, but is also um, appropriate for changing times, right? I mean, the, the, you know, the Democrats will wheel out this quote from Thomas Jefferson, where he says something like, um, it would be it would be absurd for um, a, a document uh, 17 years old to govern the people of a modern day or something like that. And, you know, whereas Thomas Jefferson had this more radical view that, you know, the Constitution should be sort of regularly uh, amended in, a, in, a, in an ordinary process generationally. Because that's because that's just a fairly reasonable position to take, um, and so you could have term limits as well as sort of uh, you know independent committees that uh, provide the initial screening process for nominees to the court. This is what I think the UK does, where they have sort of an independent judiciary committee that provides sort of, hey, Prime Minister, here's five people that you can nominate, and then the Prime Minister picks amongst the five that have already been screened, and then it's typically a ceremonial appointment process because you've already got the independent judiciary process um, as well. I think Canada does something similar. I think they have term limits for their justices as well. They have mandatory um, retirement ages, I believe Canada does. Okay, they sure, have some sort sure. Of, some sort um, of function, yeah. And so I, I just don't think that we need lifetime uh, appointment. You know, we don't have a lifetime appointed Federal Reserve chair, but the Federal Reserve is incredibly politically insulated. Um, and I, I don't think that you need anything, um, you know, I don't, I don't think term limits do anything differently to the court. Um, I think that they, one of my They wouldn't be insulated. I just want to say they wouldn't be insulated if they were expounding on the meaning of like the second amendment. If the federal reserve, I understand that federal reserve wields enormous power and maybe even more day-to-day -day power on the American life of a regular person uh, through their use of uh, monetary policy. I understood, but if they were ruling in the way on issues to the import of the American people, the way the Supreme court would, there would not be an insulation politically. And there, it would be very, very different in my opinion. Well, no, I mean, well, I'm also, saying, I just like, want to point out, have, I'm sorry, I think you should have a, I mean, I think you should have a one term limit, right? So if you wanted to say like, hey, if you're going to be appointed to the Supreme Court, you have a one term limit and it's 10 years or something where, you know, in theory, you don't have a lot of motivation to, you know, politically justify your opinions going forward because you know that you're only going to have a one term limit as well. Um, that kind of goes into the second point that I was going to make, which is that I think that, um, you know, people I think people have like economics brain where, you know, like a lot of wonky people on Twitter will say shit like, oh, you know, we shouldn't have subsidized renewables. We should just tax carbon. And that's like per dollar, the exact same thing. And it's like, OK, well, you know, if you want to just, you know, throw all politics and sort of context out, that's one thing. But I think it's the same thing with justices. You know, I think that um, uh, Thurgood Marshall, when he was uh, getting nominated to the court, he said something along the lines of what did he say? He said something along the lines of like, um, well, uh, the way that I make my rulings is I kind of just try to do what I think is right and then let the law catch up. And he got criticized for that. But the reality is, is, I think that literally every single justice just has some sort of moral foundation that they use. And then they judge in accordance with that. And I know that people like Scalia will say things like, oh, no, no, no. Every good judge will make decisions that he or she personally disagrees with. 
I don't think that he's telling the truth. I think that every single one of these justices is hyperly politically motivated, not because they feel the the pressure of getting thrown out by the voters or anything like that. But I think that these are conservatives and liberals on the Supreme Court, and they are ruling accordingly. Um, the best example of that, the last thing that I'll say is um, when Amy Comey Barrett was up for appointment, um, Dick Durbin was questioning her on one of the decisions she made, which was that um, uh, basically she said that felons would uh, be allowed to own guns and that it actually was unconstitutional when she was a circuit judge, when she ruled that um, felons who uh, are barred from owning guns, actually that's unconstitutional. Um, to which Dick Durbin said, well, I thought you're a textualist. I thought you just read the text of the law and then you apply the law. Well, you're not a Supreme Court justice when you're making this decision. You're a federal justice. The law says people who are felons cannot own guns. And what she said was, well, I went back into the history and I discovered all this context and I, I basically found a way to rule against it. She yeah, I, is a person who is a conservative and she makes conservative rulings. I don't think we can pretend that these court justices are some political body. If you heard me to be like a formalist or some person who believes the um, the law exists in some real space somewhere, I'm a realist uh, before I'm any of that, right? So I, I agree that uh, these are people, these are human beings with failings and biases and all that stuff. And I understand that these people have their biases and I don't, I don't dispute that. And I don't dispute that they'll they'll give certain benefits of the doubts to one party or one political view versus others. And, you know, you've seen it happen. And I think the example you can, there's a lot of examples of very polarized topics in which there's a clear division along sort of ideological lines. That's true. Yep. But I do agree that the Supreme court is the most reasoned branch despite that, because they, they have to put out their opinions. And I, I do think that sometimes they, they or often they're more united than you think. It, recall, we're talking about in the context of a nine O decision. So whatever the the split was here, there are nine justices who disagreed with me. The liberals came with the conservatives, met and said, "Hey, we this was not okay, and we're undoing what Colorado did." And so, the, first of all, there's more agreement than I think you're giving them credit for. And sometimes the the splits aren't what you expect them to be. And so, yes, I agree with you that these are ultimately people who are fallible, who are political. But that doesn't mean the institution as a whole is not worth preserving and that because you can't perfectly insulate that no insulation is uh, is needed or necessary. No, no I've, so, I said I said what my reforms would be, which would be having sort of an independent committee and some sort of term limit. Right. I don't think that the institution of the Supreme Court should go away. But I, I do think that it's it's I think that a lot of conservatives and like more like establishment pol uh, politician types. Um, and I'm not saying that's a UP school, obviously. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that generally this rhetoric that I hear is. Well, the Supreme Court is infallible. This is just an apolitical branch of people. Who says who that nowadays? Making... I'm going to call you on that. Who I, well, says no, no, that, no. Econoboy? Like, dude, are you kidding me? Like every time who the Democrats talk about, every time I... the Democrats talk about adding court seats, that people will say, "Oh my goodness, that's so partisan." You're packing the court, and it's like well, every politician no, but, but packs the court with people who politically agree with them. This is not a new thing. This well, is not I, I don't, an I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with that. But I just don't. I don't agree that you're assessment that people are viewing the court as apolitical is correct. I mean, if, I think if you look at the public perception of the legitimacy of no, public of perception, yes, I'm talking about okay, the but, but at least types. the establishment types, I don't hear any Democrat. I mean, Biden went on stage and is like, I'm sorry, justices, but I'm going to do some shit to undo what you did. I mean, that if that <laughs> is not a, Oh, okay. Okay. That's a really good pivot point right there. Cause also bridges where we were at the beginning. Do you, do you take issue with that? A lot of people, no. uh, I'll, Okay. I don't take issue with that because if I I'm hearing Biden to say something that is not in conflict with the court, the court's ruling, just like the 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 student loan where they're like he's defying the constitution. No. If you are using a certain authority to do some policy and the court rules against that uh, and says you can't do it this way, then you can try other ways. Just like Trump did with his Muslim bans. He sure. tried the first one, you know, and then he tried a second one, tried a third one. And then the third one was the one the Supreme Court said that, hey, that's actually okay to do. And so it's not the case that because Biden is saying, I don't agree with you, I'm going to make some changes. I don't have a problem with that. That's as long as what he's proposing is a constitutional thing or something that that is, um, I, what I think, if he a proper an exercise. F what if he pulled an FDR and threatened um, to try to court pack? What if threatened he, what if the he court was a, specifically to, or or generally just saying the, hey, the Supreme gonna... Court? So right now there's a federal statute which locks the Supreme Court's composition at sure. nine justices. That it's been the case for 150 years. It can be overturned. So Biden, if Biden basically be, said, if Biden said, listen, 
I'm going to make it very reductive just so we're all mm -hmm. on the same page. If he basically took the posture, I'm the president of the United States. I am not your subordinate. We are supposed to be co-equals. So you fuck with me a little bit. Now I'm going to start fucking with you a little bit. And if my party takes majorities in both chambers, I'm going to repeal that federal statute and pack the court. I would argue to the extent that there are checks and balances which flow from the president to the Supreme Court, FDR's threat of a court pack was an example of the president using a bully pulpit to say, chill, you can't be striking down all my shit 24 seven, back off. That is, you, wait, wait, I think that that's a valid check and balance. I okay. So one of the checks and balances in the Supreme Court's power are one, Congress funds the Supreme Court, Two, they can make exceptions to their appellate jurisdiction. And so Congress, if it wanted to, could make, uh, you know, make the exceptions to all the rule and say, you have no appellate jurisdiction to even hear these cases. And uh, the president, of course, to the extent that he has a role in the legislative process, is allowed to wield that. Now, if he's making specific threats as the commander in chief to the to the to the Supreme Court directly and saying, like, hey, if you don't rule this way in my case, I have the power. I'm going to I think that's improper if you're trying to wield it as a. There are ways that it could be phrased or sure. extortionist method, you know, methods that he could employ where I would say that's improper. But using only the power that he's been delegated in the legislative process and his control over the political branches, hey, we are allowed to make the Supreme Court as big or as small as we want. That's a legitimate use of power. Just like McConnell was technically allowed not to have a hearing for Merrick Garland, the president and the, and the Congress allowed to pass legislation to change the jurisdiction of the court to add seats and um they're not allowed to, to say that they're term limited but i'm in favor of expanding the court for reasons i've already outlined, no but, yeah. sure sure i i understand that but see the, the the thing i guess that i and i wasn't trying to catch you in a trap oh, sure, I, was, yeah. I was curious where you were on this because again so i i actually and i linked this in chat i i went fishing for what i called my mega effort po post from <laughs> eight months ago um, on Destiny's Reddit, where I said Dems should totally fuck with SCOTUS ASAP. That's the title of it. And I'm going back and rereading this, and I'm still, I'm just baffled. Um, at how, how right you were? At not only how right <laughs> I was, but also how OP, how OP our Supreme Court is. Because the thing I keep uh, the thing I keep struggling with is so you have other countries and other states, right? So so you have laboratories of democracy here in the United States as well as but as well as like foreign peer nations whose Supreme Court, they take the approach that, that the court system plays a role, but it is not to supersede the primacy of the more proximate democratic bodies. In other words, you know, you take the United Kingdom, which is a constitutional monarchy. They have a fucking monarch. They don't have a codified constitution the way we do. And their high court, as we know it today, basically sprung into existence within the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. The, the court plays a role in the UK, but the general approach is parliament is better. Parliament is more powerful. Parliament's more important. The court plays a critical role, but it is not to supersede the role uh, again, of parliament. Again, I just, I, I want to bring your attention to the cases which are bringing I, this forward. And these are all cases in which the Supreme Court says, if you want abortion rights, legislate it. If you want to enforce section three, okay, legislate but, but here's, it. But this is the sleight of hand. Aren't they okay. doing it? of hand there for political reasons didn't we just say that by effectively kicking the can back to congress under section three of the 14th amendment they've effectively rendered politically they have the politically they have because they think know they, that will never happen politically they have and and maybe that that was the rationale i think that part of it they didn't want to make the decision so I, i'm a realist in that sense but institutionally they did give it to the political branch and they said we're not here to say how you enforce it it's up to the political branches now i think that's improper for reasons i already stated because in my opinion the people already enforce section three but and I, already I think implemented the, the problem with that though is that it, we have to i just think that there's a reasonable analysis to be done like on like like josiah on like the genuineness of that ruling because i i would be like it's you have supreme court justices gesturing at getting rid of gay marriage saying that well you know hey i mean this was an improperly decided thing and we should leave it back to this wait wait wait, 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 wait i just but, want to pause it again i'm so sorry for cutting you off no, i but i that's understand another example point. i i understand yeah. like about throwing it back to the legislature right no but no, 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 no that's not the, the point. point the point is that that right of gay marriage 
is a judicially created substantive due process right that was never voted on by the people. Well, now, now well, the right of the well, right of gay marriage is codified right. into law because, because now it is correct. Yes, yes because Democrats right. snuck that one in or but, rightly put that one in. Yeah, I, I find I would I would find it I would find it difficult to believe. I mean, you referenced the student loan forgiveness case where yes. it just seems so incredibly clear. That if you read the statutes that were passed Agreed. by Congress, wave, and you and and you and you understand, practically speaking, the enforcement mechanisms thereof of those statutes, that Biden had every power to do what he tried to do. The I Supreme totally Court agree. said, "We are going to reverse engineer a way that he doesn't have the power to do this." So on the abortion issue specifically, I find it hard to believe that the radical right wing partisan court would look at a democratically dominated legislature passing a bill that codified abortion protection nationwide i would find it in incredibly hard to believe that that court would just let that happen very hard to believe that, that i happen. also I think have they my doubts as well think, yeah. i think they would reverse engineer a way to vote against it because they are not nonpartisan political actors they are right-wingers with right-wing opinions doing right-wing shit but, but you, you you have to you have to again you have to do analysis then on what basis it would be because there is a basis and that is from where does it, congress derive this authority to, to enact legislation and if you're going to say the commerce clause then you need to actually run the analysis or what you think the commerce clause properly says otherwise what you're saying right. is i think congress should be able to do anything they want all the time and no no I, and peace yeah. code, that's all i'm that's all i'm responding yeah. to is this idea that well and i understand to some degree you're playing devil's advocate the idea that well yeah. Hey, I mean, you know, hey, let's be fair here, right? The the court technically is saying that it's up to the states, it's up to the the democratically elected legislatures to to decide these things. Um, but the reality was, I think if they did decide those things, they would just find another reason to vote right. against it. So, so that's 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 kind of that. There again, that's where I'm going back in my 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 mega post here, and I'm just mm -hmm. shocked because there's no oversight. So. Let me let me dial it back a bit. So so <laughs> just guy is reading his own post like man. <laughs> this is the I, I am. I'm like this is this is gonna be this is gonna be fat material later. But it's like again, I look at it in practical terms. There's no way we're gonna get a constitutional amendment. Those are the one things. Those are the it's the one legislative or executive act. There's no um, way you're impeaching where, the court. Whereas it's evidence. not reviewable. It's not justiciable by the Supreme Court. So, but again, two thirds supermajority, three quarters of the states, not gonna happen. And then I look at SCOTUS's ability that they have assumed themselves to just strike down as unconstitutional with a simple majority vote, federal statutes, state laws, executive orders. And there's really, by the rules that SCOTUS wants us to play by, nothing that Congress or the president can do about it. Other countries either, you know, they, they'll, 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 modify the composition of their courts so they'll expand them they'll impose mandatory retirement ages they'll impose elections or term limits or both or some combinations thereof in some countries in some states in this united states there has to be a super majority to strike down a law like the united kingdom is a great example the the high court in the united kingdom cannot declare an act of parliament unconstitutional they can basically send it back for review but then parliament can go no we're elected by the people go fuck yourself right now typically in the United Kingdom, the popularity of the courts is much higher here, which, by the way, Peace, I feel like that's something which also should be factored in. Mm. You know, there's this notion that Congress wields the purse and the executive the sword and, con and the court's are supposed to have judgment. And basically their power is in whether or not the other two branches buy into their judgment mm -hmm. and whether or not the people buy into their judgment. Well, right now it's not looking good if that's how you define the legitimacy of the court which some people say that is how you should define the legitimacy of the court. They're listening the to the rulings. And um, my intuition is, yes, there are a lot of bad instances where the court can step in when they're not supposed to. I couldn't agree more with Econo Boys on his interpretation of the student loan thing. I can go at length about why that was a ridiculous overturn by the Supreme Court. But my intuition is I, I'm very, very fearful of authoritarian takeover in this country. I think the incentives are a little bit different in a parliamentary system where the parties have much more control. Here, there is a unified head of state and the parties don't necessarily control what he what what that president does. And I think when the chips are down, um, you're I know the chips seem down right now, uh, but you'll be glad and you'll be happy that there's a, a court 
Well, what's well, what's insulated. to what's to yeah. keep this court from going rogue? I suppose because that was the other thing I was thinking when you and Akana Boy were going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Like maybe maybe this would be the other way to pitch it. We have elections for members of Congress and for the president. And so at least in theory, the president has to be a bit careful and Congress has to be a bit careful because they their positions can effectively be revoked. But the way the Supreme Court's designed now, it is effectively dominant over the other two branches, right, in terms of its interpretation. It can issue orders to Congress and to the executive, but not the other way around. Mm -hmm. They're also unelected. They're not mandated. There's no mandatory requirements. Ethics requirements, Pisco. That's fucking insane. They 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 question. We had Samuel Alito publicly <laughs> question whether or not Congress had the authority to impose ethics requirements on the Supreme Court. I I challenge. You're not going to hear me defending. Look, you're not going to hear me defending Samuel Alito. Alito Scalia, Alito, Scalia, Scalia Scalia died on the ranch of a guy who was currently under review by the Supreme Court. Right. Right. I mean, not to mention all the gifts that they get. I mean, it's it's just. And I to it Josiah's is. Point. I think that. There's in I, I don't know what Josiah is exactly saying in terms of what he feels like the scope of the court should be, but I, I just think that there's the the, the 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 tyranny that I fear is the tyranny of the Supreme Court. And what I mean by that is that the Supreme Court is talking about they've already waved away one right that's been established for 50 years. By the court itself. Years, by the court minor, itself. No, no. Well, Pisco, I, I understand, right? But we, yeah. we we understand that's that courts can establish rights depending Not on Not if you don't have judicial review. If right. you have judicial review, that those laws are still in force. In Texas. Well, okay, well, well, nonetheless, I don't, I don't think you agree with the Dobbs decision. Maybe you do, but like, I don't. But I, but I agree with Roe, and Roe was the law of the land because of judicial review. No, no, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with judicial review, okay. right? And I, maybe Josiah is, but like, okay. what I'm saying though is that, um, the the court is talking about taking away established rights from people, like however they were established, right? Um, and I think at the point where the court is saying we are going to recreate second class citizenship status by taking away something like the right to a gay marriage, I, I think that, that that is the type of tyranny that I would want to avoid, right? And that's why something like a independent nomination process and term limits and things like this, I think can help that problem, not completely gutting any authority the court has. And to be fair, I don't think that's what Josiah is probably saying. Um, but, you know, having, you know, some sort of independence on the, the nomination look how, side. Look at how I, Congress responded to those threats, right? And, and overturning Dobbs. I know not on abortion. But the, again, and I think it matters that these a lot of these rights that you say are established are established by the very court who, in coming to understand those rights, is striking down laws. And I know that you're not saying that you're against judicial review. This is more directed at Josiah. Um, Josiah, in response to Dobbs and the thoughts of maybe the court is more open to uh, undoing um, Obergefell, Congress acted. And Congress, and now I know you're saying that they could maybe strike it down. Um, in, in some capacity, could. In the future, but we don't know that net now, and we know that at the very least, Congress did respond, and Congress passed a law, and that law, at the very least, shows that Congress is thinking about and and being reactive to decisions that they don't agree with from the court. So, so my position, my, let me, I'll put it more organically. My position is this: that the Supreme Court of the United States was never intended, and I would argue it's irrational not just in terms of our structure, but in the structures of other advanced democracies on earth. The Supreme Court of the United States is not meant to be the most powerful branch. It's supposed to be Congress. I don't think it is. I think the president is right now. How, but the president how, is the most powerful branch of the government right now. In terms, and I, in I don't terms really think of, it's close. In terms, of, in terms of the ability to act proactively. But again, yeah. The president can't issue an order to the Supreme Court. The Supreme no, Court can't to. issue an order to the president. But the president doesn't have to. The president right now is in charge of this the president incredibly doesn't have to large bureaucracy, uh, where, where, which absolutely institutes policy. L look at the night and day difference in how foreign policy, domestic policy, and the lives of people has been affected by the change in administration, Joe Biden, into Trump, even without so, implementing legislation of any kind. So, 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 so what I will say is it depends on how we evaluate power. And again, in terms of activity, the ability to be proactive, the ability of day-to-day -day influence, I completely agree with you. The president is, he's effectively a branch unto himself, right? And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a very proactive branch. I will not dispute that. But what I'm saying is that the deference that Congress and the president pay to the courts, it is a top down. It is a, the way it is currently structured, it is effectively a top down relationship where one branch can issue orders to the other two branches, but it not work the other way. Technically, it could in Congress, but you would again need a constitutional amendment. Federal statutes, as we just discussed, even the Respect for Marriage Act or the Defense for Marriage Act, 
I think it's the Respect for Marriage Act, which was passed to codify yeah. Obergefell protections. This 6-3 conservative supermajority could strike it down like this. And we talked about inventing bullshit legalistic reasons. They're, they're, these Supreme Court justices But it might not, not be stupid. bullshit realistic reasons. It, I, might, it might be real reasons. It might um, be good. Sure, but what I'm saying is you, you can't <laughs> – I don't think you can effectively square this with the fundamental notion of checks and balances. The Supreme Court is de facto uncheckable in the way it currently conceives of its relationship with the other Should two Should Congress be allowed to violate the Constitution? And if and, and who decides whether something violates the Constitution? Well, it, it's, a, it's a matter of what do we feel like the role of the Constitution is, right? And, and do we feel like the interpretation of the Constitution should be – static generation by generation or is there room to interpret what we feel like are the established rights in the constitution on a generational basis right because i agree like for instance with the um with gay marriage right i think i think anybody with a brain in their head and who's being honest would recognize that i don't think you know the the, the framers of the constitution who wrote the amendments that were justified in overturning the uh, the state constitutional bans on gay marriage thought Oh, when I'm writing this, uh, you know, this is going to make it to where gay marriage is legal nationwide yeah. or like that's yeah. effectively how it should. And so I recognize that's a generational point of view for a more modern court, which was a significantly more centrist than it is today. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. Right. And to Josiah's point, I'm not sure if it's if it's so wrong. The idea that the court can establish rights uh, based on the interpretation of the same text over time and yeah, that that's a judicial philosophy point, Econoboy. And I agree with you on right. that point. Yeah, that that that's it's perfectly valid and not it's not the first time that it happened. And one of the reasons why I disagree with the framing of the court right now, even though I do agree it's highly partisan, um, Neil Gorsuch, in a similar case about the um extent to which protections and employment discrimination cases extend to uh, gay people and LGBT individuals, said even though that they didn't have in their minds when they when when Congress passed a restriction on discrimination in the workplace based on sex that they weren't thinking about lgbtq the fact of the matter is that if you discriminate against a woman being being married or attracted to women um and you wouldn't discriminate against a man be attracted to a woman that is a discrimination on the basis of sex and so those are examples or that's one example in which yes there have been uh judicial philosophies that have been flexible enough even for the most one of the most conservative members neil gorsuch to rule in favor of the liberal cause so what, what, is that, what, is, what, is, what does that have to, what do you mean it's not as clear cut like all, all i don't think I'm it's as clear cut that all these uh supreme court uh justices are stuck in the 1820s well don't get me I, wrong i don't i don't think they're going to bring back slavery or something like that yeah. I, I don't think that this is a this is a handmaid's tale type you know radical right-wing government but i think i haven't seen that show Right, right. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, like, certainly it's the case that if you saw the this, State of the Union rebuttal by Republicans, you saw about it, yeah. a 30 minute segment yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, yeah. like, certainly it's the case that this group of nine people uh, as, a, as a collective is significantly further right wing than the average American. Right. And I think that one of the things that is interesting is that um, I think 538 did a similar analysis, actually, which showed that um, the the disaggregation of Supreme Court decisions with general popular sentiment has been very, very notable with this current Roberts court yeah, with all these right yeah. on, right? I, I, and so I, there's I, certain idiosyncrasies where like you, you mentioned like Gorsuch, you know, he's very progressive with Native American issues and he had that one ruling about sex discrimination in the workplace. Totally agree with that. But I, I just don't know if that's a good But look at the like, response, right? When, when there's a desync between the people and the court, the response on the left, look at 2022 elections. What has been the case? Even in ruby red states, you are seeing abortion protections being put into action. And there has been in response to a court that is out of touch and that isn't ruling, in my opinion, on many of these cases correctly, there are checks on that authority. And the Supreme Court's not going to step in um, <laughs> until and unless they, they rule Go that, ahead. like Flip Alabama, this. the embryos are individuals. We can talk about that later. Um, they're not going to step into Ohio's abortion ban. Now, yeah. knock on wood. I don't think they will. That, that, that I, I really doubt of, they yeah. will. <laughs> right. I really doubt they will to right. say you're not allowed to protect abortion. But the but the gains that that Democrats have made in like in the post Dobbs era, what I guess what I'm saying is again under the current paradigm, even if even if those gains manifested itself in a federal abortion protection, SCOTUS, this SCOTUS could strike it down. So I keep going back to it's not supposed to be a top down linear relationship. 
they're supposed to be, I would argue, notions of checks and balances, which work both ways. And by the way, I think the president should have a more meaningful role in the ability to check the court. You can say, well, Congress in theory can defund it. Congress in theory could change its appellate jurisdiction. Congress in theory could impose mandatory regular, uh, you know, ethics. What power does the president have? I'm just going to flip his... it around on you, Remini. So, if, sure. if Congress passed something that said states are not states are forced to have um, constitutional carry laws, that is to say, they they are not allowed to have. Uh, You're you, no. I'll bite this bullet. I'll bite what, this. What bullet. you say? You say Congress should have the right to do that. I, what I'm saying is I would absolutely disagree with the outcome of that 100%, but I think as a general paradigm, even, even if it can be used against me, I think that it's healthier for an advanced democracy to have a court that is not so protected from the political branches. That's my point. I fear a rogue Supreme Court more than I fear a rogue Congress fucking with the Supreme Court. That's That's where I default. This, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I fall into a similar bucket. Oh, I just, yeah. I don't know what you mean by like, because I think you have to be careful with, I think in general, when it comes to holding the judici the judiciary accountable, I trust Congress more than the president because Congress is a collectively elected body. And you have to keep in trust mind this like, Congress more than well, the president. Well, well, well I mean, personally, well, I would say that it, when we're talking about delegating authority, I would say that because you have to keep in mind any power you give the president, you, you would have to think, well, how would the worst person individually who has sure, this yeah, power? Yeah would enforce it. And so Josiah, to your point, like, what do you mean when you say the president can hold the judiciary accountable? Because now I'm imagining, well, if Trump was in office and the judiciary ruled, hey, you know, uh, you know, turns out you can't just fire everyone you can fucking think of and destroy all these brands <coughs> and do all this and that is what, what's the authority that the president has to hold the judiciary accountable? Yeah, well, it depends. There's I would argue there's probably no constitutional basis for it because the Constitution doesn't be besides nominating Supreme Court justices, which require Senate confirmation. So even the one, you know, de jour check that the president has on the Supreme Court um, is tempered by con by the by the Senate. Um, non acquiescence, I would argue, is a big one. Um, this idea that the president that we just take it for granted that the that no matter what bad faith rogue ruling comes from the Supreme Court, the president is obligated to follow it. I as as much as I fear a rogue president, and I do because obviously I'm, I'm anti Donald Trump. I also look at the meaningful ways in which the president can be checked not only by Congress but by the courts. But it seems to only go one direction from a rogue court, which is the ro a rogue court can check everybody else. And nobody effectively can check a rogue court. Yeah, I, I guess my so, intuition is just different about the, where the danger lies. And I think that there are rulings that I could foresee, like imagine the Supreme Court said you have to kill all people of minority race. And that's the like I, I can think of rulings that would be so bad that the, the president would have to he'd be duty bound to ignore it. I, I, I don't I can't like I'm, I'm not telling you that I can never think of a hypothetical where I would be. I guess, but I don't think we're there yet. And I'm well, more fearful of a Trump like figure having more of an avenue to centralize uh, power. Well, and to be clear, I want to be very clear. This is why I find this conversation so fascinating. I'm not saying that there is a single default solution um, that I am comfortable with. I think that this is the problem when you look at the structuring of nation states. There's no way to completely bad faith proof it because it all requires reciprocal yeah. good faith as Agreed, much as yeah. possible. I want to be clear. So I, that's why I find this fascinating. So it's a cost benefit analysis. The way I look at it though is again, I, we are we stand alone. We stand alone in so many respects with how powerful our Supreme Court is. And I'm not saying that that necessarily makes everyone else right, but to me it does say something. That, what about the First Amendment? We stand alone in the First Amendment. We do. I, I'm not right, but I'm not saying that every <laughs> that every nation. And I think First Amendment is based. Yes, but you don't think that a court this powerful is based. That's what I'm saying. Just because like there are some ways in which that we are relatively unique, like with First Amendment protections. I'm not saying again. I I, I added that caveat that yeah. that doesn't mean that simply because we stand alone that we're wrong. But I'm saying that it does to me. It is fascinating to me that other advanced. D d democracies and even states within this country look at their high courts and go, okay, we, you don't get a blank check. You're going to have elections. You're going to have term limits. You're going to have mandatory retirement age or all three or combinations thereof. America is an exceptional country. I, we I also offer birthright citizenship to everyone who's born here. I, there are many ways in which America is different and special. And I, I value the ways that we're different and special. And sometimes but and do not you value always, it but in this particular way. I do and value it in this way. Yeah. So, so, so let's see, expanding the court. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Mandatory retirement ages. No. Imposed 
ethics rules, as in one branch telling the Supreme Court, you will not please, you will abide by these ethics, these mandatory recusal requirements, these, you know, disclosure forms. And we're going to put like this one special review board or what they, would be my question or what? Or what? Okay, so so are you are you <laughs> saying you can be prosecuted like anyone right. else who breaks? The oh, law? if it's a criminal law, <laughs> if it's a criminal law, I think that's that's probably okay. But um, to so the there, extent, that's what, yeah, there would have to be some sort of threat, right? Yeah, that's my question. Right. Is, or what? So would you be comfortable with the threat being prosecution by the executive branch? Yeah, if it's severe enough, then maybe yes. But um, again, oh, I love look, that. Look, I kind of like that. I like look that. At where, look at well. where we are now. You're talking about envisioning laws to like go after Supreme courts criminally for crimes. And so whatever that is, it's like, it needs to be very, very high threshold. And typically ethics rules are not criminal matters. They're not, they're just not for any other judge, uh, unless it re reaches to a certain level, right? Where it's actually but can't other judges, but, the, but sure. I understand that there, there's not the, the threat of criminal sanction, but like, correct me if I'm wrong. Can't, can't like, um, hire judges. Yeah, they can they can come in they and, can, and they can say, take the case away from them or do something like that. Right, right. So uh, listen, I'm not saying it has to be the threat of force. But who's either, gonna but do it? Right, like there has to. Is it some independent agency that Econo Boy is inventing? Where are they can't they be retired they, judges or recycled judges be, or random like, a lottery of judges? I don't trust. I have to say this. I don't really trust this Congress or a Trump presidency to put some impartial people and decide who gets thrown off the case, put on the case. In you know because they determine the the conflicts or non conflicts. If someone was like, "Oh, you donated to Obama once, so you can't hear any case Obama was on," like I don't know, it just seems like well, no. What about I, assume, I mean, I think I think I think that would be I don't know. Like I, I do. I guess I may ha may have a more radical view in terms of the ethical requirements of of all positions of government um, because I would say that. Yeah, like like even even something as mundane as that. Like if you're a Supreme Court justice, guess what? You can't make political donations anymore. Just can't. Yeah, but do half it, of these, no, but right? back in the day, like, right? I, back in the day, they might have worked for the Obama Solicitor General's office. And if you worked for the Solicitor General's well, office, sure. I mean, I'm you you'd, you'd obviously have to, to Of course, you assume you'd obviously have to say that hey, you know, at the point of becoming a federal justice or something like that. I mean, to be fair, I would say the same thing about um uh, you know, prosecutors in the in the attorney general's office, right? It's like, hey, you know, if you're going to be an AUSA or something like that, you know, you have to you have to maintain basically to the greatest possible extent, like complete public and, and private political impartiality. Not that you can't have political opinions, but, you know, you can't be, you know, going to fucking <laughs> rallies for Joe Biden at the same time. When okay, you so if Josiah were cases. attorney, if Josiah were appointed attorney, let's suppose Josiah's a, a, a I'm getting hot under the collar at the thought and, of it. Uh, oh, man. Uh, Biden, Hunter Biden gets elected for his first term in office and he appoints Josiah as attorney general. What do you mean by that? W what do you mean? I, no, no. I mean, I don't, I don't think he's, don't a, he's a political Again, actor. He's, I, he's I'm, a I'm recognizing that every court justice is a political appointment. So I recognize that somebody who's getting appointed to the justice to, to the bench yeah. is being appointed. So because of their political affiliation, they their were shot. History. They yeah. were so, shot. So what is this but, value but at add the of point, the ethics? But does at it really the, matter? I mean, does no, it, does yes, it, of course it okay. matters. Right. No, what because I mean to say is like, point, I understand ethics matters, but what I mean is like in terms of the public perception or in terms of what outcomes occur, um, how much is this just on the margin? If we already think that the mere appointment signals, the I think when we, when we when we think about okay. when we think about it, certainly it can prevent excesses as well. But I think that also when we think about um, you know, I think you said it earlier that sometimes perception is reality, or somebody oh, on this panel, yeah. said, right? Which is I that, said that, yeah. <laughs> um, like for instance, I think if you could if you could peer into the truth of the universe through God's eyes and just simply I'm right here, no, right there you go, right? <gasps> but and just and just simply know for a fact that there is no ethical concern with. Clarence Thomas taking, you know, money to give speeches or for his wife doing the same thing or any not if, recusing if we, himself if, from if, cases. No, exactly. If we could just know for a fact that this does not affect Clarence Thomas's judgment, I would still support all of these rules. Huh. Because at the end of the day, we can't peer into the eyes of God. We don't know that. All we are left with is the trail of circumstances that would lead any reasonable person to believe that this is a corrupt act. And that's so why money in politics is bad. That's why these ethics rules need to be applied. Yeah, sure. Because confidence in institutions, I mean, you should know this, Pisco, confidence in institutions I agree, yeah. makes or breaks institutions. And so when people Willis point to be, trails like this, so Willis should be, uh, should be forced off the case. 
Wow. I don't know who, who. Oh, you're talking She's about the, the district attorney from Fulton County. Yeah. See, I would argue there's a difference between a prosecutor huh. and a judge, though. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute. Okay. No, so this was this was where I think you did a disservice. We're not going to completely change the subject. Sure, sure, Ellie sure. Mistel yeah. in his criticism of Attorney General Garland, because I do think, and I say, but I say this is a layman. Maybe I'm wrong, but my layman's understanding of the legal system is there is a fundamental difference between a prosecutorial mindset. And a judge's mindset when a prosecutor on behalf of local, state or federal government is going after uh, the other side, they're not trying to be fair. Conflicts they're trying to of get a are not as important. Uh, wait a minute. Just let me let me, okay. let me fucking finish. OK, <laughs> but I do think the role of a judge is there is supposed to be you. You are supposed to be above such partisan prosecutorial mindset that you're supposed to. I would argue. I would argue, here's a hot take, it shouldn't be a hot take, but it might be from you fucking Pisco, is that the Supreme Court justice, the every the Supreme Court justices should be held to higher ethics standards than the president of the United States. What do you think about that? Uh, Yeah. I don't, I don't know about that. I'll have you to think don't. about it. Yeah, I don't. Fuck I'll, I'll, I'll think I about just, it and get just, back to I you. I just think generally it's fair to say that all, all of our elected officials should be held to quite a high ethical standard um in, like generally speaking and i would i would say that at the point when like at the point when you have justices going on ranches of 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 uh, you know billionaires who are having cases in front of the supreme court seems shady for sure i yeah. I, I would say that again and that's the point is that all that i in my view for for my rationale all that i have to prove to convince myself is that it just seems wrong and insofar as it seems wrong Certainly, we should try to plug that hole because if people start to lose confidence in these institutions because of perceived corruption, I mean, look, I've, I've known local politicians who I knew a local politician who said, oh, I had to sell like I had to review my portfolio because it turned out I had like uh, it, like a, 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 a piece of land. Yes, they're held to the high standards. Yeah, too, like so. and Listen, I, it's I, ridiculous, right? I that, agree. I, I agree with that. I just, I, to be 100 percent clear, when you have Congress, people like hauling into court these ridiculous you know impeachment inquiries into joe biden that are totally baseless on on provable falsehoods or um, misleading facts and all that stuff when i see that kind of conduct in this congress on what has become of our legislators i'm not disagreeing with you necessarily that ethics matter and that some of these appear to be ethics violations or there needs to be something some other process that could be invented i am wary of congress being in charge and uh, in a substantive way over the judiciary. I, I think that there needs to be an independent judiciary, even if it's only in the appointment process or whatever, whatever you want to say. But I, I just think that I'm, I don't have the same confidence in Congress that you guys do. Well, well I think it's Congress. also because, like, for instance, I think yeah, I it's also say, like, because it's, 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 yeah, it's harder for this. It's harder for Congress. I would argue it's harder for Congress to act. So you're talking about powers being divided between what, 535 voting members. Um, so not to say that Congress can't be politically damaging as as the uh, as MAGA Republicans are to to President Biden, potentially. But I would argue that it's infinitely easier for the United States Supreme Court and its nine person composition to issue a ruling because, I mean, can't can't litigants judge judge shop file a, a case in a certain district they do. Knowing yeah, they that, do. It, that it'll make its way to the Supreme Court. They do. The Supreme they, they already Court, do that. Yeah. The Supreme Court grants cert based on its own discretion. So if the Supreme Court and a conservative legal system really and, and when I say legal system, I don't mean hundreds of actors. I mean, handfuls of actors want to really get a particular issue to the United States Supreme Court, I would argue it's infinitely easier than Congress to, to no, act. But they, but they do that, and Democrats do it too. And, and sometimes it's based when Democrats do it. And I think a good example of that was in Wisconsin, where there was a change in membership, and the Democrats played by the Republican yeah. uh, playbook. And there, mm. was, and there was a responsiveness to the unholy map. Like, think about the Wisconsin maps. Gerrymandering right? maps, yeah. You're telling me, right? Like, if, if that legislature, in, against the clear command of the Wisconsin Constitution, which was enacted by the people of Wisconsin, right. that they should be unmoored from any kind of review of their decisions, and that the people shouldn't be able to respond by by. I know that the the, the link to the judges or the justices in Wisconsin is more direct. You vote for correct for the judge, right. um, and maybe that's a solution that you're in favor of. Although I'm I'm not for for some reasons, but uh, there, right? Don't you think that was based? Don't you think that was base for the? Yeah, you're never you're <laughs> yeah. never gonna get okay. me on like I, I'll never quibble with with various outcomes. I like for example, again, you you, you point to the Roe v. Wade, you know, abortion rights in this country. My understanding is, 
And again, I'm not a lawyer. You are. But my understanding is that even like liberal and progressive attorneys said that the that the logic employed by Roe v. Wade was tortured, even though we favor the outcome. I'm not going to the both of these things can be true at once. I, too, would prefer legislative uh, outcomes to judicial activism. I, I don't think that these things are mutually exclusive. So when you say, Josiah, you know, this version of the Supreme Court as it's currently structured, maybe not its current composition, but the way it's currently structured can deliver you outcomes you like. Shouldn't you take that into consideration? Sure. And I, but what I'm saying is I feel like I feel like increasing checks and balances against this court, again, either mandatory retirement, term limits, expanding the court, super majority requirements to strike down constitutional, this idea that you can strike down an act of Congress with a 5-4 majority, maybe it should be a 7-2 super whatever. I mean, there are all sorts of configurations and permutations yeah. of a court that we can consider. I like that idea more. I like the idea that even if it risks potentially costing me outcomes that I'd prefer, yeah. the idea of our institutions being fuckable with each other by each other <laughs> instead of just two and then the one held apart, which is currently in the hands, I would argue, of a 6-3 radical conservative supermajority, that is uncomfortable with it. I, I don't see how there's any timeline in which it's emphatically worse when you make the Supreme yeah. Court more vulnerable well, because we, you can we, say well well the good the good cases might be at risk but so too with the bad cases you know so i i just don't understand how it's how it would be work can you i think when the chips when, when the chips are down you'll understand that's all i can elaborate right now but and you might say the chips are down right now i think from a broader more long-term perspective for decades into the future i i think having more i i think that this court is checkable in many ways um, and between the actors I'm most worried about in our current constitutional system, the Supreme Court is near the bottom of my list. I think the states have been misbehaving. I think Congress has been misbehaving. And in Trump, if he's in office, he'll be misbehaving. So well, I, th um, I think that yeah. the thing the thing about I think that what's interesting, though, about democracy and democratic system, and frankly, just like government structures in general, is that we've really run quite a number of experiments right and that there there have been thousands of different iterations i mean probably tens of thousands hundreds of thousands if you're counting the local and, and sort of provincial level of different ways to structure government right and it seems like in the it, this is an argument we had with destiny i mean it was i think it was the three of us not stack yeah. games but it was josiah <laughs> yukisko and myself where don't worry we were arguing about, such uh, an institutionalist simp on the, on the garland thing right well, well no um no no it wasn't just the I, I don't think it was the garlic the garland thing it was um the, the filibuster, senate filibuster, right yeah. where yeah. he he is like destiny's stupidest political opinion by far is that he thinks that the filibuster is actually a good thing um yeah. and um i think he also to some degree believes in the electoral college and um, his concern is like, well, he's like, well, I'm, I'm just concerned with, um, oh, well, uh, if you have like, oh, 51% of the country can just do whatever they want. And there's like literally no check and pack. It's like, well, the thing is destiny. And th this is my response to you, Pisco is like, we've run this experiment. There are like more, there are very hyper majoritarian governments out there where, yeah, like if you have 51% of the parliament, you can just pass whatever you want. Take the you UK can get rid of your example, head of state. Right? You can get yeah, rid of exactly. your yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, you vote in no the UK. I mean, like that. Yeah. for God's sakes, in the UK they have the House of Lords, but the House of Lords never fucks around because what they always say is, "Well, you know, if the House of Lords ever fucked around, they would uh, we would just abolish them. The House of Commons would just get rid yeah, of them. Well, but the parliamentary systems well, are a little different. I mean, they, no, no, the ahead. parliamentary systems are different. But what I'm saying though is that if you look at the structure of many other Supreme Courts, now again, I'm not necessarily talking about reducing the scope of judicial review like Josiah is talking about, but at the very least, I think that. Something like a self-replicating independent a, a nomination process uh, with a term limit is just so incredibly not radical if you look at many of the other structures. And I think many other countries on the planet have been able to guarantee robust and to a, a large degree greater civil protection and human rights than our court has been able to guarantee or our governing structures have been able to guarantee without having this like incredibly unaccountable lifetime appointed court i mean somebody mentioned in the comment piece go like what what if we came up with a with cybernetic augmentation where people could live 100 mm -hmm. years longer do, do we think a guy from the 1800s just because he Good could live point. to be 200 years old should be able to be on the court for life no of course not yeah I, I, I think that there's a <laughs> I, I think the life tenure starts to make less sense when you increase so i agree that there's a year's connectivity there to it um 
and there's some like upper bound. Yeah, I think there's an upper bound there. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you it can't be any way else. It, it can't be something, some other reform or or we could never function as a democracy with lifetime. I'm not there here to go. tell you that. We're but getting in there, Josiah. Once right. we're out of time. We're nudging him but that's never been my position. That's never been my, position. <laughs> my, my, my position is that it's not worth our effort right now. And I'm and if everyone was agreed on it and we could pass an amendment on it, um, and we could cap it at some long term of years, because I think it should be long. I should be, I think it should be more than ten years, because uh, I think there are good notions of having some uh, people being re, uh, judges being repeat players. I think that makes sense too. So I would certainly be over ten years if if we get everyone sort of agreeing on that notion and have it be a long set of years. I suppose maybe I would be okay with that as opposed to the lifetime tenure. Lifetime tenure for me is just like a it's a, a way to get there and yeah. for people to understand. And since there is that upper cap on human life that, Hey, you're not going to be able to uh, influence this person. That's why I think it's such a good, like a rule of thumb. But the problem is that would take so much political capital in my opinion, and it would make Democrats look unhinged. Like they just want to uh, control everything and institute uh, autocracy. It's not worth our time. It's, it's better worth our oh, time well, to yeah. win elections and to nominate people in the positions that already exist. No, I, and maybe I, I would pack, agree with that. A little bit more. Well, well and I, would so agree I don't think that, anybody but... here is quibbling with the practicality of it. I just, again, even that answer, even that answer that you just provided yeah. is not Supreme Court proof. <laughs> so it's like, let's focus on getting people elected and pass laws that we like. Oh, fuck. They still have to go up against a six. An amendment is not Supreme Court proof. And, yeah, but okay, again, then that's, that's a that's, war. Yeah, that is again. I keep going back to the statistic is statistic, right? So you have twelve thousand attempts to modify, amend the Constitution, and only twenty seven amendments. It's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. We're not going to get a constitutional amendment anytime soon, which, yeah, by I the agree. way, would require us revoking so all kinds all, of gerrymandering. To me, it's almost, yeah. and, I, and I'm sorry, it's an important conversation. So I, I, yeah. I know that what I'm about to do is going to be dismissing Dude, it or, or saying it's awesome. Say it. I'm going to say it. It feels a little bit to me. Like we're the socialists talking about the communist utopia that could that could come in some other state, it's hypothetical. Because yeah. to me, it's such a outside the realm of possibility that we can get an amendment to get rid of term limits. That I would just rather play the game that we have. Yeah. Um, and I think that the, the, the rule of thumb of the rest of your life is okay. We can play with that game, and it makes sense from a longevity standpoint. Well, this, oh, sure. is, this is a principled, abstract conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think that to to be fair, when we're talking about. Like, honestly, I think that the current composition of the Supreme Court probably helps Democrats get elected, if anything, right? Because I think that every time the court rules something incredibly radically right wing, as they are one to do these last people respond. Years, yeah. Um, yeah, people tend to get really pissed off. And as much as Trump wants to say, like, he wants to cake and eat it, too. I appointed we got rid of Roe v. Wade, but also don't blame me for the abortion stuff. I mean, you know, it's like a very difficult messaging campaign that the Republicans are faced with where the court might rule, you know, something completely radical and somehow simultaneously the Republicans in closed doors or when they're talking to primary voters, they'll say, look at what we did. We appointed all these right wingers to the court. Isn't that great? But then in the general election, they'll have to say, well, you know, uh, we appointed all those right wingers to the court, but, uh, yeah, you know, the Democrats are groomers. Never forget that. Right. You know, it's like, it's not a good look for them. And so I'm not sure it's a great use of political capital either. And I'm not, I, I don't think Biden has shown any, I don't think Democrats are planning on running on that message anytime mm -hmm. soon. Um, okay. But, you know, certainly I, I think uh, if we're having the principled conversation, I think um, there's, there's definitely, I think there's definitely room. I mean, we, I, on the three wonks podcast, we started, I, we did an episode recently about all the things we would do to change American institutions. It was like a two and a half hour long discussion, which literally it, we must've talked about a hundred different things we would change about the whole structure of the American government. To make things better, um, you solved the American. You solved American institutional in like necrosis in it, two and it, a half hours. That's fucking. Uh, y'all should y'all should like and subscribe. By the way, the Three Wonks podcast. <laughs> if you have not already, seriously, you should. It's good. It took quite a lot of time, but no, I mean, well, I mean, to be fair though, I think that that to, econo boy, say something nice funny. about the conservative justice. Say something nice about each one of them. Um, well, I would say that you know Clarence Thomas. Um, he, I think he is probably one of the more principally conservative justices. I think he was a lot more principled than like Alito or um, or Scalia. Um, because I, I think that he even talked about how he he's like he's talked about how like even he doesn't think that the federal government has an ability to regulate like marijuana use. That he thinks that it's yes, just, it just functionally just shouldn't be allowed. And he disagreed with Scalia on that. It was one of the few disagreements he had with Scalia. Whereas Scalia reverse engineered a stupid reason why he would be against it. 
Um, I like Alito because he shows how incredibly crazy some of the right wingers are on the court. He's great for that purpose. Just well, so no, he's also really good at oral forget. argument. He has some of the hardest questions. And yeah. it's it, you heard even it if you're first. against it. Well, he's, he's one of the good at this. He, he, makes people, he, game, he makes uh, people squirm. He makes people squirm. And I hate his questions because they're usually very good. So Neil you Gorsuch would say that Alito's, on yeah, to clarify, I'm sorry, to clarify, you would say that Alito's oral prowess makes people squirm? Can you stop this nonsense That's right true. away, Ruben, or uh, just, uh, yeah. I keep that name in you, sorry. Uh, stop it! Hey, by the way, yeah. it's, it's because of Staxiums that I changed my name, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I've only oh, been okay. quite a bit. No, rum I, one and eight. Unbelievable. Clearly it worked. I, I kept calling him rum one and eight, and he's like, I need to change my name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I was going to um, say, like, it's it sounds funny to say that you know, you're able to solve these problems in a two and a half hour conversation. But I think that 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 does I think that that does go to show, however, that you really could you really could only change if you if you did like five different regulatory changes or structural changes. I think that that would legitimately solve maybe 90 percent of the issues that at least I would have with the Supreme Court. And I think that we would have a much more structurally sound and, you know, a, a sort of a, a amount of confidence in the court going forward um and same thing with let me give you what you want let me get let me let me tie this all together with a bow i'm not against reforms in the main i am skeptical about any reform that would require a constitutional amendment that's what i'm skeptical about um and so i would be open to expanding the court <laughs> to changing elements of the jurisdiction maybe um so you have me on that but i, I don't love us being so invested in like the term limit stuff and the independent agencies appointing, I think that that might be a little bit um, pie in the sky, even if it is eventually a good idea when we have cybernetic enhancements. Short of short of a constitutional amendment in theory, couldn't the Supreme Court engage in judicial review? Like even let's just of say the like the judicial revocation of, uh, yeah, or, or, or sorry, the legislative revocation. Yeah. yeah I mean, ethics I mean, concerns, the, the appellate uh, process, the composition. That's a crisis. If, 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 con if Congress says, Hey, we're eliminating appellate review over this, and con and the court says no, you're. But that's also what Israel happened. You guys know what's happened in Israel with the court a little mm -hmm. bit. I don't know that much, but there was an effort by the Knesset, I believe, to strip jurisdiction or at least some kind of authority from the court. And the court ruled that that revocation itself was unconstitutional to some degree, and it was a close decision, I think. How do you guys feel about that? I thought you guys, you guys are probably like awesome base Netanyahu sucks and all that stuff, right? But. At the same time, it's doing exactly right here. You're so fearful of, which is taking away the power from the legislative branch. But but there, when when it's in your favor in Israel, I think I think we would all be like, that's super base for the. Well, I, see, I, I don't see there's a disconnect there. I, okay. I'm sure many of us would celebrate on outcome, the outcome, on outcome. Of, of a flawed that's, process. That's an outcome oriented approach. It's not. But a I'm, wait a minute. Approach. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes. Wait. I'm I'm confused. Are you saying I can't celebrate? A, a, are you saying that I can't simultaneously quibble with the process and want to change the process, which I do, and also not celebrate now? Am I obligated no, to no, say? I, that, I think people yeah. will quibble at you for being unprincipled if you say I'm okay with judicial review when Netanyahu's in power. And in, in what if I what if I take the position that as long as judicial review is a reality in the way in which it exists? I'm fine with this particular. Well, why outcome. is Israel bound by like America's judicial review? What Israel said is we, or at least the voice of the Knesset. I don't agree necessarily. All of Israelis believe this, but the voice of the Knesset, the elected membership of their voice, said we're done with judicial review, at least in this way, whatever way that was. I don't. Again, I don't know all the details here. So, but just assume it's it's how I'm well, saying. It's, it. it's just a matter of why they made that decision, right? So, like for instance, I think that in the case of Israel, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with. Um, like the democratically elected government doing things that they feel like represents their constituents. I think that the issue, and again, I'm, I'm about as familiar with it as you are probably, which is to yeah. say not deeply familiar, but I think that the issue that a lot of Israelis had with that, um, which is why it inspired so many protests was that this was like directly, um, this was a direct attempt to try and get Netanyahu specifically to be out from under all of these corruption charges that were brought against him. Right. And so in that regard, I'm not criticizing the, you know, ability of the judiciary to review these things. I'm criticizing the proposal of the democratic government to amend these processes, basically just for the to purpose one of person this? Yeah, corruption. I, it's the same thing. Like, I, I don't necessarily disagree that, you know, hey, if if the like you get you mentioned Republicans could pass a, a, a law that would institute constitutional carry nationwide. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree that Congress should have an ability to pass nationwide laws. 
I would just disagree with that law, law. that was passed. Right, know, exactly. right, right. Or or take it another way. So like somebody, I think it was a convoy who earlier mentioned the filibuster. You know what's funny? Is I don't advocate for the abolition of the filibuster because to me wow, the filibuster cringe. is a tool. Wait a minute, let me fucking finish. Because <laughs> the filibuster is a tool that it's like a hammer. It can be used to hit a nail or it can use to crack a baby in the skull. I, I it, it has a utility. The Democrats use the filibuster appropriately, I would argue, at least in terms of the outcomes I like to stop Republican governments from enacting policies I dislike. However, what I, coming out. however yeah. what I propose is in all instances, in all instances, no matter who is in power and who is in the minority, I think the filibuster should be harder to use. When the filibuster was created, the imposition was on the filibustering party. You had to get your ass up there. You had to talk on topic. You had to stand. Basically, the, the, the bargain was this. We have a majority. The majority should generally be able to get its way. If you, the minority, want the power to stop the majority, you're going to get your shot, but they get to kick back and the burden is on you. I think I don't think that that's unprincipled at all to say I would still keep the filibuster. I would just make it harder to employ uh, because it's a tool that can be used to stop bad faith Republican government. So why would I get rid of it? I would just make Instead it harder for both parties to use. Jumping jacks and, and see how long they can do jumping jacks. And I'm not saying it has to go that far, but I don't, yeah, I, yeah. So, so, to, so my point, but my point is, Pisco, I don't think that, I don't think that that's unprincipled at all. That's me saying that here is a tool that on the whole, I'd like to keep, even though I know it can be used against but you me. You want to change it to better calibrate it. Yeah, I, yes, I understand. Yes, which is that. how I look at the Supreme Court. I, yes, I, I recognize that all the things I propose could be used against me. I, I don't pretend that that's not the case. I just think that on the whole, it would be better for everyone if the Supreme Court were not so unaccountable in its current structure. Because would so you be much saying is the riding same thing. Them. Would you be saying the same thing if they were all they were coming to decisions that you all like that you liked essentially? I, I hope I would. We don't live in that timeline because we haven't had a 50, we haven't had a liberal majority in 50 My years. My guess is but 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 here's <laughs> but here's the reality. Regardless of whether or not in that alternate timeline I would say it, it yeah. would still be true. I don't, I, it's so, so wait a minute. So, Pisco, do you think that if Barack Obama, if you, let's just say Joe Biden, Joe Biden is a president I like, you, you've watched my content, you know, I like yes, him. Yes, I like, do you think I would support, Father Joe. do you think I would support Joe Biden declaring himself dictator for life? No, I don't. So, there, there you some, go. That's your, well, no, that, but I, I think there's some measures that you, that are so whatever, right? But, but never forget, Josiah, never forget. That there's the other ratchet as well, and that this court, maybe not this specific court, but five four upheld Obamacare when they could have uh, explained that one for me, Chief. Explain Sibelius. I don't think and, that this is the worst iteration that the court can possibly okay. be. I want to be very clear. Okay. That I don't that I don't think this is as bad as it gets. I think the court has gotten considerably worse there are, there are decisions like Sibelius that uh obviously went the way i want this the supreme court still it's not like it, sh it strikes down it's not like it rules against the president or democrats in every opportunity i'm just saying that we have a structure which does not really incentivize good behavior and good faith behavior i would argue by the supreme court unless they fear consequences and, and you know when i was most proud of our judiciary ruminate and why i defend them and now I'm going to get on my soapbox. Ready? This is me getting on my soapbox. Do it. Get you stand up. Because when the chips were down in 2020, and the, I'm going to say it, the barbarians were at the gates trying mm -hmm. to steal our 2020 election. You know who was a force field protecting us against that? The United the States Supreme Control, Court. The United States Supreme Court, the federal judiciary and state judiciaries all over the country were putting up walls against these bad faith attempts to steal our election and our democracy. And so when the chips were down, they defended us from the tyranny of Trump. And so, yeah, maybe they rule against me on Section 3. Maybe they rule against me on any number of policies, Roe v. Wade, Dobbs, all that stuff. But when the chips were down, and when the 2020 election was in dispute and they were trying to steal it from the people, they defended us. Okay, but now we're four fucking years later, baby. What about now? What about the decision to take the case? They are not obligated to grant cert. They took the case. We're going to hear Trump's immunity case and to schedule it the last fucking day of their term. Wait, I have, I have a question. And while, 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 while issuing a stay as well, does that not benefit? They didn't Trump issue a stay. No, they didn't issue a stay. I thought it was issue stay pending no, no, a ruling. No. A stay would have been worse because a stay would have signaled it would have been longer and it would have signaled that they're going to rule in favor of Trump. But I, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Sorry. So 
I'm well, number you. one, I, I would just say that, um, you know, for instance, in the UK, when Boris Johnson tried to suspend Parliament um, in order to push through his you know, package of reforms, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they even even their Supreme Court yeah. said this is illegal based on basically pure procedural grounds. And so I think that similarly, I'm not sure that any reform that I would recommend would, would cause the court to act much differently in response to 2020. But the question for you is, let's say that um, with this specific case on the presidential immunity stuff, because if I if I it's actually so unbelievable, if I understand the arguments that Trump's lawyers are making, they're essentially making the argument that the president can basically do literally whatever he wants. And the only way to hold the president accountable as the president is to impeach him. And that mm -hmm. unless you have the votes to impeach the president, you basically can't do anything to the president, no matter what the president does. Right. By um, the way, that is the Justice Department's position, just so you know. And I'm going to well, explain yeah, why. Whatever. But yeah. the point is, though, is that I think that the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court actually agreed with that logic, like I think that there's a there's an upper bound. You mentioned that there's an upper bound on the age thing. I think you talked about like what if the court ruled that. I don't know. There was a that would be extreme. Yes, yeah. so if they like, rule that would be... Trump in this case, that will fundamentally change how I view the Supreme Court for sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. and and that's 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 good because I, there are just certain things that I feel like if the Supreme Court ruled, that would be so incredibly crazy. Like, okay, because again, like the the implications are Biden can just put Trump in prison and just arrest every Republican in Congress, and there's no consequences because now there's only Democrats in Congress. Like the the logic would be crazy, and that's part of the. Thing that I think Josiah is signaling to the fact that they would even take this case is is crazy. It seems like right, like it's it's very uh, worrisome. I, listen, I don't like that they took it. I think that there are four, maybe four justices who are trying to potentially slow things down. Keep in mind, though, in the in the main run of cases, it's extremely fast for the court to take this up. And so I was absolutely disappointed by the court um, deciding to not just uh, deny the the petition for cert or the whatever they interpret it as the petition for cert so i, I agree with you and, and that's just it signals to me that there's some at least some justices who want to slow down the proceedings but that doesn't signal to me necessarily that you're going to get um five votes to say that the presidential immunity extends uh, to former presidents on anything within their official ambit so to be a, a thousand trillion percent, percent clear if the court were to rule in favor of trump in this case that would fundamentally change my my view of the court because that decision to me would be so uh perverse so beyond dobbs beyond well, what if, what if even here. one justice ruled in favor of it um no i don't think that, i don't think that that's it reaches that threshold if the court is a body i'm gonna say um but it would absolutely change my view of that justice but for me alito in many ways and thomas are kind of there already in in my view of how i view their uh, position on the court even though i respect the fact that they are justices I, I don't really think that there's a lot of principle at least a lot of their rulings um or how their their opinions and i have reasons for that but I, this a case i think is very important for me in terms of how i view the legitimacy of the court that said yeah it is way faster than any supreme court opinion briefing typically is uh special counsel smith directly asked previously the supreme court to take this case and said you were the only one who can resolve it and the special counsel has not really given any good legal reasons why it should be expedited, right? What are the good legal reasons why it should be expedited? You're going to say, well, the election's coming up. We want to have it before the election. Is that a legal reason to have it faster? I don't oh, know. You're asking. That. You're asking. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be rhetorical. You don't have to answer it right now. But like, think about it. Those of you who are saying the court. I don't agree. I think the, 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 that the court uh, granted it when they could have, they should have just denied I'm it. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Quick fact check. I'm yeah. sorry. W wait, Pisco, what's the difference? <laughs> they said that uh, for when they granted cert, yeah. that the DC court, who had pr the, the previously highest iteration of the court, which ruled on the immunity case, um, they, they told the DC appellate court to put its ruling on hold. That's different yeah. from a stay, right? Yes. So a, a okay. stay, gr granting a stay would be like, you're likely to win on the merits, or at least there's a good chance you're going to win on the merits. And it would be longer too. It would indicate, it would signal that the Supreme Court agrees with Trump substantively because one of the standards for doing that is to show likelihood to succeed on the merits. And it would be longer. And th there definitely wouldn't have been a, a tr now there's like, it's probably not likely they're going to have a trial before uh, the election, but it would absolutely kill it. Um, so again, yeah. the, the question on the table is as follows. Can you think of a legal reason why the Supreme Court should expedite hearing this case 
as opposed to a political reason. And, and I think, remember, Jack Smith has not argued, hey, you should consider the election and having this trial before the election as a, as a reason. And think about how you would feel if the court were influenced by like, oh, we want to have this trial before the election so the American people know. Like, that seems like exactly the kind of thing that you don't want them to consider. And so even them using, you know, Jack Smith's unwillingness to cite that should tell you a little bit about what are the incentives in this case and the fact that it's being heard on a much, much, much faster timeline than most other cases, I think should say a lot. How quickly, so, how quickly did they hear the immunity case or not the immunity case? Fuck it. The 14th amendment case from Colorado much faster. But the, the reason for that was there's actually a legal reason that is the, the, the deadline legally of the, uh, primary is coming up and there needs to be some disposition on it before the primary, but there's no connection, right? The case relates to the thing that's about to happen. That is the, the, the section three claim, the legal claim is connected to the event that's close in time. That is the primary itself. There is no necessary connection, legal connection between the criminal case and the, now everyone knows that there's a political obvious. Could you make the case that there is a lead that there? Wait a minute. How do you parse between national interest? How do you parse between politics, national interest, and legal? So what I would say is a legal reason to have it first is because there's some dispositive event that's going to come. It's going to moot everything, right? So like if you if, if there's a, tr a tractor trailer outside of your sorry, not a, a, a bulldozer outside of your home. And the question is who, uh, do you have the right to bulldoze it? Sure. And uh, you know they're gonna bulldoze, bulldoze scheduled in two weeks. And so the court needs to have a disposition before them because if they wait longer than that, then they're gonna bulldoze your home. And so they wanna do it quickly. That would be different than maybe, um, and, and maybe I can elaborate in a more abstract way to define those differences. But, uh, but um, well, that's fair, but couldn't you make the case then by that standard isn't, you know, the, the timeline with respect to the trial versus the election, at, doesn't it have some legal basis? Because if Trump wins the presidency, he can he can order the he can fire the special counsel. He can I think it's more attenuated. I think it's more attenuated. But so you'd have to go down the line like it, it's not direct. It's it's a couple more steps. Because it, it it assumes a, a couple things, which is like one that that Trump will know, win. The Trump will win. Two that Trump will shut down the cases. Now we all think he will, and we all know he will, and we all think it's it's possible that Trump get elected. And we all know that this case is relevant to whether Trump gets elected or not. But in terms of whether the court should consider those facts, like should the court be thinking about whether Trump will take away these cases or or, or promote those cases? In, in a sense, we kind of give discretion to the president to have control over the executive branch. And so mm -hmm. why would it be improper for the president to um, appoint an attorney general who agrees with him and the attorney general then like, dismisses the cases is that something that's like inconceivable uh, and something that i think that you think that merrick garland should do i think you thought that merrick garland should be more aggressive and explicitly political against republicans and so it would seem inconsistent for you to then be like fucker yeah I, I reject the framing of that part right there i would just I ask mean, him to, i would just ask him to like i don't know uh not make political considerations in the other direction like golly gee we have a predicate here there were prosecutors who worked for Garland who said that there was predicate to investigate Trump formally after January 6th to start a formal investigate. People tried to do it to launch a formal investigation. I don't know anything about that. There's not been a, I'm, I'm well, well, I will link you to it. Special... Listen, we will have that separate yeah. argument. I will link you to the article and we'll yeah. hash it out. I'm just saying, I agree. Let's go after Republicans as a political consideration, but also let's give Republicans even more slack than we would otherwise, because it could be seen as political if we just, okay, fair enough. You, my, that, that is also my ending point is yes. I, uh, to Econopo's point, this case would matter a lot in terms of my view, of the legitimacy of the court, but I don't think what they've done so far in failing to just deny outright and accepting the, the, the cert grant, which the special counsel asked for in the first place and the presence of all these factors that this ruling is like the worst they've ever done or something that signals that they're going to rule in favor of Trump. Um, I think it's bad, but it's not. Yeah, I have curiosity. What do you make of the argument, though, that, OK, if they were going to look at this case, they should have just granted Smith's expedited request in the first place. If they were if the it, why? Why? I know that it was it's unusual, but it's not unprecedented. It is unusual. Yeah. Well, that's what that could be enough because Smith did not give a legal reason for why they should do that unprecedented thing. Now, I happen to think that maybe he should have just bit the bullet and said, Hey, we all know the election's coming up, da, 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 and do the kind of analysis that you're arguing for, Josiah, which they could have done. They chose not to. And mm -hmm. so if the court is not hearing the legal reason why they should expedite it, can you blame them for being like, no, we're going to do normal things? And again, I don't agree with what the court did, but you have to also 
deal with what Smith did. And Smith asked for review and didn't give a extremely pressing legal reason uh, for the extraordinary um, expedition that he, what's, what's the word? What's the noun version of expedited? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what expeditious uh, timeline? Yeah, exactly. Expedient, expedient, maybe. Sorry. It's a, yeah, no, 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 it's fine. It's mush. fine. Well, listen, we're, we're, we're three and a half hours in oh, and wow. there's so much I want to unpack here, but listen, well, let, let me just say this. Um, we'll give everybody closing statements. I tried to at this guy earlier, this Nick, Nicholas Demas right here. Uh huh. Okay. I've tried to at you, but it's not letting me. I don't know if you're on Discord or if you're on Twitter. You DM me on Twitter or Discord. I'm going to put it in here, and we will set up time for you to educate me. Um, I'm putting – that's my Twitter and pondering 1018. And by the way, the people I'm with are the most argumentative fucks you've ever encountered. So if you guys disagree with Pisco or Conaboy on anything, let's set something up, and we'd be happy to, uh, to talk with you about this um uh but yeah so all i'll say in conclusion and i'll give it to the rest of you is that uh i'm pretty pleased with the idea that we're moving pisco just a little bit in three more conversations pisco is going to want a 45 person iteration of the supreme court <laughs> all term limited with mandatory we'll retirement ages and it's going to be federal statutory requirement that only democrats can appoint those justices in the first place that's where pisco is going to be in three conversations yeah, and where you'll be is uh, oh, drinking a genochronium with your friends uh, in the Department of State and the DOJ and manipulating events behind the scenes and going after uh, MAGA conservatives who just want Beautiful. to defend the country. Yeah. All right. So so Convoy, Stax, Pisco, any any final words or plug plug your shit too? Um, definitely three wonks. I need to put that in there. Actually, can you can you all type in chat? Oh, sh which, which chat is that? Uh -huh. I don't uh, think I can. I don't think you can from uh, restream. Okay. I'll send. I'll send it while you all are talking. I will find your YouTube. Links. Yeah. yeah, I think um, all that I would say is that uh, yes, I agree with Josiah. We're we're getting peace go closer to Athenian court where everyone's a court justice if you show up to the case and you all can vote on it if you want and I think that's a really good movement. I think overall for our country. Um, no, it was really fun talking. I think uh, obviously we're all seemingly strong. Well, if I had to guess, like relatively strong Biden supporters or you know center left people. Um, and for those wondering, there's definitely CIA money behind this show. So <laughs> we all got our checks in the mail uh, this past Friday. So I'm excited to get that money flowing in. Uh, and yeah, it was it was really fun talking. And um, yeah, I guess subscribe to Three Wonks if you want. And Go from there. So. And a con boy. I've linked that too. I'm getting Pisco stuff right now. So Pisco, go ahead, baby. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a very interesting discussion. Um, I I love the both aspects of it, kind of shooting the shit a little bit and being a little unserious, um, which I think you guys are all sort of in good fun. And and also I, I do love the in-depth disagreement and, and the discussion there. I think that, again, uh, not to put to find a point on it but like we all basically agree in the main strokes about where this country needs to go and more specifically where this country should not venture and so on that point i'm glad that we can be a voice for um i don't know for a more rational discussion from the left and one that's based in um electoral politics and winning um so on that note thank you guys very much and, and it was a pleasure to meet you stack uh stacks for the, for the yeah first time. no i'm i'm um, glad i i pushed you with all of my eloquent and verbiose arguments uh no I, um thanks for having me on yeah you're welcome guys uh, thanks for doing this i'd uh this was kind of a trial run to see if we want to do something like this in the future again my pers my conception was 90 minutes but there's so much shit to talk about um we'll see uh so Even more narrow know. next time. More narrow. I know, fuck yeah. it. But it was because honestly, you and I were supposed to. We were, yeah, we're yeah, trying yeah. to find some time to have some of these conversations. And I know Akana Boy is at least a little bit like me in the sense where he wants some institutional changes, but you are too. So I wanted to test where the balance was. Staxiums is an institutional shill. He wants nothing to change. To the core. He thinks that Democrats. We fought about this. Everything's all the time. fine. He thinks that Democrats should continue to to play the game of politics on the hardest mode possible. No changes whatsoever. So <laughs> that's exactly yeah. my position. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Guys, oh, wait, please wait, like wait, and last subscribe. Thing, Zaya, when do you stop having control over my social media? As soon as you leave the stream. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. 
Appreciate it, guys. Uh, again, hopefully we'll do this again soon. Thank you. Thanks for chat for participating. For sure. Thanks so much. Yeah. Hey, so, okay, fuck you. All right. Seriously, everybody, I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Um, again, the chat kind of went all over the place because there was so much to talk about, but the original conception is 90 minutes and uh, with more like specific topics, but I had to I had to talk about the Supreme Court stuff and like the structure. It's so fascinating, like constitutional systems and governmental systems. Um, he said one of uh, the nerdy things I like to do um, is, you know, just kind of conceive of if you could optimize a democratic republic in terms of codified structure, what would it look like? The, the game is like Republican, GOP proof your government. And obviously there's no way to do that. Right. Again, it's all it's all predicated on reciprocal good faith, but it's fascinating to see like the United Kingdom and, um, you know, various Scandinavian countries, Canada. I mean, a lot of Commonwealth countries, not just the United Kingdom, um, Brazil. Brazil is a great example where they have taken, you know, they've been influenced by the United States and they've taken so much of what we did and they've improved on it like many countries adopted an electoral college, but then ditched it along the way. Um, and so, yeah, I, it's fascinating. Awesome discussion to listen to. Would like to see some good faith arguments representing conservative legal perspective and possibly some human bad faith mag arguments. That'll happen um, initially, um, or that'll happen eventually. Um, we definitely want people, like I said, we can make time for that, that five by six guy and Nicholas Demos. They can just at me and, uh, we'll make time to have conversations and stuff like that. Um, would love to, would love to, uh, to do all this stuff. So, um, wait a minute, maybe it doesn't hang on, hang on. Maybe I have to unpair them. Is Stack still streaming? Because I don't want to have total control of their stuff. Can somebody confirm if Stax is still streaming? I believe Brazil makes the justices debate. Yeah. <clears throat> so like they, they're also, they have... Um, I think they bifurcate their Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken. They have one which effectively makes like constitutional considerations, and then there's other which is like the highest appeals court, whereas our Supreme Court, that's the other thing. It's both the highest appellate court and also determines constitutional matters. Oh, fuck. Pisco says I'm still online. Ah! Hang on. Let me, let me, let me, we're going to unpair this. How do I do this? Do I have to end stream? No, I don't want to end stream quite yet. Um, we're gonna. All right, I'm gonna. We're gonna end stream because I don't want to like. It's it's not fair to them to to keep like regurgitating my stuff. But yeah, I appreciate this, folks, and um, we'll do this uh, hopefully again in the near future. And then I think I'm streaming by myself um, on Tuesday. So appreciate it, everybody. Please like and subscribe. Pisco, Akana Boy, and the Three Wonks and Staxium.